Hi, I'm Dan Costa, professor and director of the Institute of Marine Sciences at University of California at Santa Cruz, a member of the Ocean Studies Board and a member of the UN Ocean Committee. And I'm a study of physiological ecology of upper trophic levels. Hello, everybody. I'm David Miller with FUGRO. I'm Government Accounts Director for the Americas Region, but I also lead our um, engagement and participation in the UN Ocean Decade globally. I'm Stacey Karras. I'm a Senior Program Officer with the Ocean Studies Board. Hi, I'm Craig McLean. I'm <laughs> retired from the level of representation that Nicole now holds, and I, I was at the IOC for 11 years and spent four of it trying to help build the decade, and I'm anxious to see what the progress is that we're making here. Thank you very much. Uh, Liz, you want to come up to the table? Good afternoon, everyone. Liz Terpak from NOAA, but I also serve as the chair of the interagency working group for the Ocean Decade. Selena? <clears throat> Hi everyone, I'm Selena Harris. I am a Canals Fellow supporting the Ocean Decade Portfolio at NOAA. Okay, now for our online, I'm just going to go through the list as it is appearing on my computer. Um, so, Amy? Yeah, Amy Bauer, member of the Ocean Studies Board, a senior scientist at Woodsole Oceanographic Institution in Physical Oceanography. Scott? I'm Scott Glenn, a professor of marine and coastal sciences at Rutgers, uh, so a member of the Ocean Studies Board, uh, the U.S. Uh, National Committee for the Decade, and um, several years ago, I was chair of that U.S. Committee for the IOC that uh, worked with Craig. Paul? Hi, Paul Williams, uh, Fisheries <laughs> Policy Coordinator for the Suquamish Tribe, a member of the Ocean Studies Board. Uh, Thomas Chance? Yes, uh, I'm Thomas Chance. I'm a former a founder and former CEO of CNC Technologies and founder and former CEO of ASV Global, and I'm a member of the OSB. Hi, uh, Adam. You're on. Yes, hi, Adam Blomquist, uh, U.S. State Department Office of Ocean and Polar Affairs. I'm a co-chair of the Interagency Working Group on the Decade. Allison Reed. Hi, everyone. Allison Reed, also at the State Department Office of Ocean and Polar Affairs, and I cover the IOC for us. I serve as a second uh, backup to Nicole at the IOC meetings. Okay, so I'm not going to call on all of you. So I'm going to do the ones who are, you know, involved in in the committee. So Charlotte. Good afternoon, all. Charlotte Hudson. I direct the Lenfest Ocean Program, and I am on the UN Decade Advisory Board. Mark Spaulding, please. Hi, I'm Mark Spaulding. I'm the president of the Ocean Foundation and I am on the Ocean Studies Board and uh, with Charlotte Hudson and part of the Foundation's Dialogue for the Decade. Uh, Mark Abbott? Yeah, President Mark Abbott, President Emeritus of Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution and member of the Ocean Studies Board as well as the U.S. National Committee for the UN Decade. Where is the Alligato? Hello, I'm Rosie Amalini Aligato, Associate Professor of Oceanography and Hawaii Sea Grant at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, and I'm a member of the Ocean Studies Board and the U.S. National Committee for the Decade on Ocean. Okay, so I think I got everyone who's on the U.S. National Committee or engaged in the Ocean Decade, but if I missed anyone, <laughs> please go ahead and uh, raise your hand and um, introduce yourself. Oh, Galen. Galen, I'm sorry I missed you. Go. Hi, Galen McKinley. I'm at Columbia University in Lamont Doherty. I'm on the Ocean Studies Board, and that's a member of the uh, U.S. Uh, Decade Committee. And then I'm also a member of the Working Group for uh, Working Group Five uh, uh, on um, uh, for the Ocean Decade. Thanks. Thank you, Galen. And um, 
Yeah, and so for anyone else on the line, feel free to use the chat function to introduce yourself to the rest of the group. But with that, um, I'd like to issue a very warm welcome um, to Nicole Leboff, who's joining us today. Um, she's the new, or relatively new, <laughs> I think, um, representative, U.S. representative to the IOC, and joining us from NOAA. Thank you very much, Susan. And am I then? Devices here. Am I advancing slides or will someone? If I if I am, I don't know how to. Uh, <laughs> Safa should be doing that yeah, for us. I'll do that right now. Okay. Thank you so much. I have multiple computers, but I don't think any of them are hooked up to slides. <laughs> All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's wonderful to be with you today. And of course, although the IOC and the UN Decade are not one and the same, they certainly overlap and are related. So I'm really pleased to be here to uh, offer some IOC key takeaways from the meeting this year, but also um, UN Decade related activities that we discussed at the IOC. Um, many thanks to Susan and to Larry, who's not with us today. Um, for the invitation to talk about the 2023 IOC assembly meeting um, and the happenings there that I think you all will be interested in. Uh, for me, being the U.S. representative is really an opportunity to advance the work of the IOC, of course, including the work of the UN decade, but also to advance U.S. Uh, priorities with regard to ocean science across the board. I'm also pleased to convey that after doing some digging uh, deep into the IOC files at NOAA and the Department of State, we just learned that I am the first woman to serve as the US representative to the IOC in the history of the organization, which is amazing. Uh, it's an honor to be the US representative generally, and I am sorry we missed that opportunity to shout from the rooftops, but that was not made available information to me. So we dug it out and here we are. So very important first, I think, for the United States. Um, I want to thank the IOC team for doing all of that work to dig into the files and find that out. Um, as you all are probably no strangers to, the work of the IOC is more important than ever. I was really excited to jump right in at the General Assembly meeting in uh, the Assembly meeting in June, this past June at UNESCO headquarters. And although I was new to the IOC, the U.S. delegation is very, very strong. Uh, the NOAA and State Department representatives um, know their stuff. They've been going to those meetings. They have great trusted relationships. And so I was really um, welcomed with a red carpet, and I, and I owe a lot of that uh, to them. Um, we uh, were very successful. I will say we achieved every one of our policy objectives, both those that we knew about when we came in with and others that crept up along the way. So it was a very successful meeting over two weeks. I learned a lot about the practices of the IOC, but also about uh, the friendly and productive nature of the folks that go to those meetings. It was just very welcoming and very collaborative. I was also encouraged um, about all the different opportunities I saw for working with the IOC and in the service of the IOC to leverage the US efforts and priorities um, to improve ocean, uh, sustainable ocean use, as well as observations um, and data policy, much else. So the work we do through the IOC programs and regional bodies, of course, is very critical to meeting um, uh, US and global uh, needs in terms of uh, setting ourselves up for a healthy ocean. Throughout the assembly, we focused on many, many topics, um, including, um, uh, oh, sorry, please slide two. Thank you very much. Including uh, warning and mitigation systems uh, for ocean hazards, international oceanographic data and information exchanges, harmful algal blooms, sustainable delivery of IOC activities, and of course, the UN Decade, among other things. Um, the IOC and its role facilitating the UN Decade um, has been important. Um, UNESCO is really stepping up uh, into a leadership role with regard to uh, ocean issues. In fact, it's branding itself on social media, I don't know if you've noticed, as uh, branding the IOC as UNESCO Ocean um, and really doing a lot in that space to make it known that UNESCO is associated uh, with the IOC and its work. So all the more reason to uh, build on those relationships and to find out what we can do to tap into the priorities of the other UNESCO um, bodies, uh, given the importance um, of the ocean. Uh, we are already taking steps to increase our footprint at the IOC itself. NOAA's Argo program uh, manager, Dr. Emily Smith, recently began a year-long secondment uh, or assignment to support the IOC GOOS program there. 
Working with Goose will provide Dr. Smith with an opportunity to um, benefit the US IOC team with a better understanding of how other countries are planning and executing their uh, observation programs, um, but also how those national, uh, national efforts nest into the broader Goose framework. Goose is really at a critical point um, as it navigates and positions itself working with the WMO again, with the UN Decade, as well as engaging um, additional public partnerships. And so we're really fortunate to have this person um, from the United States there to have a presence on the ground um, for Goose. Um, and I thank Dr. Smith's home office um, at NOAA for providing resources to allow her to be there. Uh, we are always open to other possible pathways for on-the-ground presence um, at the IOC Secretariat. Should anyone be interested in, in providing that kind of support, feel free to reach out. We'll try and figure out if there's something available or something that we can do. Uh, next slide, please. The United States is also uh, working to retain and was successful at retaining leadership positions within the governance of the IOC. During the assembly meeting in June, member states elected the Executive Council for 2023 to 2025. The United States retained its seat on the IOC Executive Council. Uh, Foreign Affairs Officer Allison Reed, who is with us today, serves as the U.S. Delegate to the Executive Council, so she will continue to do so. That's good news. Uh, candidates for the Executive Council Chair and Vice Chairs were uncontested and elected without a vote. Uh, the Chair will be uh, Yutaka uh, Michida of Japan and the Group 1 Vice Chair for the IOC Electoral Group, that's the group in which the United States sits, will be Marie Alexandrine Sicre of France. It's good to have friends in high places, so very supportive of both of them. The IOC Executive Council also provided input on the appointment of the next IOC Executive Secretary. The top U.S. choices uh, for the new Executive Secretary are among the six finalists um, that um, are have been forwarded to the UNESCO uh, Director General uh, for interview. It's the UNESCO DG that does interview those uh, folks uh, for the hiring of the Executive Secretary. So based on uh, the list of uh, those that we are aware of as the candidates that went forward, we feel confident that the DG will uh, hire someone with very qualified and, and a good colleague to work with um, as the new executive secretary. We expect to hear an announcement soon. We understand that the new executive secretary announcement may be imminent, but we all know how high the hiring process goes. So maybe stay tuned, but don't hold your breath. Um, we are looking forward to that. Um, uh, and as for the outgoing executive secretary, the United States has, of course, enjoyed a very productive uh, working relationship with Vladimir uh, Rabinin during his tenure. He received a heartfelt send off from the member states at the assembly in June. Uh, he will definitely be missed, um, but I look forward to getting to know the new person when they get onboarded, um, hopefully soon. Mm -hmm. Next slide, please. And of course, while we were at the IOC oh, assembly meeting in Paris, the Director General of UNESCO convened an extraordinary session at the request or at the prompting of uh, the government of Japan um, for the general conference to meet and to vote on allowing the United States to rejoin UNESCO. Uh, the IOC delegations were not directly involved in the vote, but it was happening right across the hallway buzz, applause, all the stuff. So it was really kind of fun to be there. Um, uh, soon after that affirming vote in Paris, the United States took the necessary sort of paperwork steps to actually become a full UNESCO member once again. Um, of course, as you all know, and as uh, Craig can attest, the United States remained an active voting member of the IOC during the time we withdrew from UNESCO. Um, but rejoining UNESCO really offers us an opportunity to move more strongly as an advocate for IOC budget um, and to encourage collaboration with other relevant UNESCO um, entities. Um, the U.S. presence in uh, UNESCO and in Paris is building back up. Uh, we already have an increased appointment or increased presence with the appointment of Ambassador Erica Barks Ruggles as the head of the reestablished U.S. mission to UNESCO. I got to meet uh, Ambassador Barks Ruggles at a UNESCO reception in August and was thrilled to hear that her background is in marine biology. So I can hardly believe our good fortune. I wanted to hug her. I may have, um, I may have um, that the U.S. mission is going to be led by someone who really understands the importance of coastal and ocean issues and how they're central to the climate conversations. I mean, I think I actually said to her, I don't have to explain this to you, do I? She said, nope. I said, Fantastic. <laughs> We're off to the races. And 
Then just a little bit later, I heard a lot about ocean and climate incidentally at uh, New York Climate Week. Um, happy to talk more about that um, if you wish. Uh, I also conveyed to Ambassador Barks Ruckles that the IOC needs her attention um, in, uh, immediately and has resourcing needs. She gets that as well. Uh, I look forward to continuing my discussions with her and would welcome any suggestions the National Committee might have on topics that I might raise with her. We're going to try and get me on a regular cadence. Um, so it would be open to, to hearing what you guys think on that. Um, that said, uh, the U.S. rejoining UNESCO um, is, is not a windfall for UNESCO. And this was something that we're talking a lot with other countries about. Our understanding is that um, rejoining um, allows uh, the U.S. current contributions that are being made, and you may have heard some of this, to cover our back dues and not necessarily go toward the IOC budget or the UNESCO budget, um, making it larger. This is important to note because we are in a very positive way having to level set expectations with some of our uh, colleagues that the return to UNESCO is a very positive thing. We're looking forward to it, but it is not a windfall necessarily for the budget. That being said, there is a budget increase, uh, hopefully on the horizon um, from other means. Uh, next slide, please. At the assembly, we had an opportunity to work with the uh, United Kingdom and others to build a strategic and inclusive approach to the distribution of an expected increase in the IOC's allocation from the UNESCO budget. Earlier this year, at the UNESCO Executive Board meeting, there was a, an agreement to increase the IOC's allocation of the UNESCO budget from 2% of the UNESCO budget to 3% of the UNESCO budget. I know, everybody, take a breath. Very exciting. This is the first such budget increase in the history of the IOC. So it is a big deal. And you can see it does amount to about $16 million. So not nothing, right? But starting to do some, some higher math here, not nothing, but certainly um, a big deal for the IOC. This proposed increase still requires formal adoption by UNESCO member states at the General Conference in November. It is expected to pass. I plan to be there to cheer on the vote. Um, this, again, is the first budget increase that IOC has ever received from UNESCO, and the first time that the IOC will be set up to uh, provide more than a uh, just a peanut butter approach. If you're in budgeting, you know, it's just spread it out evenly, right? Because of our negotiations in June, um, if passed, about half of this 1% increase will be allocated to IOC core functions relatively evenly. Uh, the other half will go to certain IOC programs that we identified as critically vulnerable, but core programmatic areas that require stable resourcing, including IODE, GUS, capacity development, as well as regional subsidiary bodies. As a recovering budget weenie, um, I was really pleased to be directly involved in those uh, negotiations, including helping to guide the expected increase to the IOC's operating budget. I intend to stay personally and directly involved in these conversations as we move for that first year of allocation of the funds at, at a minimum um, to see that they are reflective of what we negotiated and reflective of U.S. priorities, including being more responsive than ever to the needs of the regional bodies. Um, which are so woefully um, underfunded. Next slide, please. Speaking of the regional bodies, uh, throughout the assembly, the IOC subcommissions and regional committees provided updates and report on their most recent regional meetings and their growing requirements. Next slide, please. As much of you all know, sorry for that, got kind of squashed. Um, the decade coordination offices live within the IOC, a regional and technical subsidiary bodies and programs. That was noted, of course, by us in our negotiations. They facilitate decade regional and thematic coordination and engagement activities are critically important uh, to, the, to the decade. Next slide, please. Of note from the IOC General Assembly, a couple of decade relevant outcomes uh, and accomplishments uh -huh. include um, IOC Africa uh, highlighted the release of the Ocean Decade Africa Roadmap and adopted recommendations for the UN Decade, including with regards to GOOS Africa resource mobilization and budget. This was exciting to hear. We were certainly committed to this partnership already um, and look forward to continuing our support for their ocean observing and other capacity needs. Westpac continues to be a regional leader for the decade, including announcing four new program working groups and a progress report on the 16 decade actions in the region. In addition, uh, the second Ocean Decade Regional Conference and 11th International Marine Science Conference will be held in Thailand in 2024. 
this flagship event will take stock of the first three years of their achievement of UN Decade Ash actions um, and likely identify future uh, priorities for that region. Io Caribe introduced a new board of directors, including the re-election of NOAA's own Dr. John Cortinez, eight endorsed decade actions in the region and the task force for which the solicitation was circulated to this national committee and to the nexus. Uh, notably also the regional committee for the central Indian ocean or IOC Indio was elevated to a commit from a committee to a subcommission, uh, bringing with it increased resources and funds for that region um, and getting into the wire for our budget uh, resolution, which was a very good thing for them. Next slide, please. A lot happened. It was a very busy meeting. In other news, uh, four resolutions were passed. Several decisions were adopted. I'll highlight just a few high-level outcomes relevant to your work, but you can see the list. Uh, if you have any questions about any of these other outcomes, please don't hesitate to reach out. We can get you more uh, information. This slide just shows uh, a list of the decisions and resolutions. Many of these, again, were key to US priorities, including those related to the data policy, Argo floats, and the global climate observing system. Relevant uh, to the UN decade, the assembly supported new IOC led decade actions, including the Ocean Decade Tsunami Program and the strengthening of resilience of coastal communities in the Northeast Atlantic and the Medi uh, Mediterranean, just to name a couple. The assembly also passed a resolution recognizing UN decade implementation, welcoming the development of the Ocean Decade Vision 2030. Um, and noting the establishment of the new decade coordinating mechanisms, such as the collaborative centers and the coordination offices that I, I alluded to earlier. As you all know, the Vision 2030 process um, is going to provide the answer to what does success look like at the end of the decade, taking stock of trends, gaps, um, priority user needs, and identifying key targets and milestones um, to ensure that we're making the best impact we can. I am looking forward to the multi-stakeholder working groups assembled by Vision 2030 um, and to discussing these outcomes at the IO with the IOC community at the UN Decade Ocean Conference in Barcelona next spring. Next slide, please. And we take great pictures. <laughs> we took a lot of pictures. It was a it was a um uh, you know, it was a picture-worthy week for sure. Uh, you can see with the Secretariat um, um, and in the in the very very modern room, no, it's not modern at all, um, but it's good to be there. Um, it, Noah's investment in IOC, but also in the UN Decade and this committee, is important to us. Um, it provides um, the necessary uh, framework to ensure that we are contributing thought contributing thoughtfully um, to the decade for the best outcome for all of us and. There are an increasing number of ocean-related activities around the world. Uh, I'm encouraged by this and I welcome this, but now that I've seen the IOC in action, um, it is truly my belief that the IOC and its expertise um, should remain at the heart of our multilateral efforts to understand and convey to others what we don't yet understand about the ocean and the changes it's going. Um, this speaks to um, our interest in staying strong with IOC, staying strong with the UN Decade, because within this sort of ever complex ecosystem of ocean initiatives and activities, I think the IOC and the UN Decade both offer some of our strongest opportunities to keep science at the core um, of our ocean-related conversations. We know that we we all knew, I think, that the UN, uh, UN Ocean Decade was going to be a big endeavor. Um, and it still is. I will say that it has, I believe it certainly raised the profile of the IOC within UNESCO and with the UN system, um, at least on social media. No, I think it actually has. Um, and I think that budgetary increase uh, that was proposed last year or earlier this year that was um, likely to uh, pass is likely to pass in November is its success, uh, I believe, is due at least in part to the UN decade visibility on these issues. I'm really keen to understand how IOC leadership um, can continue to promote the UN Decade um, as well as the other IOC programs. Um, and I'm just excited to help the other federal agencies have some meaningful outcomes, um, both at the IOC and with the UN Decade. So with that, really look forward to the discussion. I appreciate your time very, very much. Happy to answer any questions you may have. Uh, with that, I think I'll stop. Thank you very much. Oh yeah, this is our sort of our, uh, ocean decade by the numbers. Thank you.
Okay, thank you so much, Nicole. Really <laughs> appreciate you joining us here today and giving us that overview of the IOC meeting and that great news about rejoining UNESCO and and really thinking about, you know, sort of it opens up some new opportunities, I think, for the US and in, in our international work. Yeah. Um, so we can now take um, questions from both the, our um, US National Committee members, but I also invite the audience as well to participate. So if you if you're on Zoom, please use your Zoom hand. And otherwise, if you're in the room, you know you can shout out or put up your arms, just like the old days, <laughs> and I'll call on you. Um, I see Scott has his hand up. So Scott, yeah, thank you, Nicole. That was a great overview. Really appreciate all that. It's great to see the progress, especially with those regional alliances coming along. That's very critical. That's where a lot of the work gets done. Uh, it's been great to see the U.S. leadership helping some of the emerging GOOS networks move on to mature networks. That was great. And I also saw that there was the WMO IOC uh, Joint Collaboration Board or, yeah, uh, that piece of it. Uh, there's new leadership at WMO. There's new leadership at IOC. They're all interested in more collaborations between the two. And the WMO has that early warnings for all program that they're trying to implement by 2027. Uh, and there's a lot of nice requirements in there that include the ocean. And so uh, I'm just interested in the collaborations that you've seen with the WMO, uh, maybe at the meeting at the IOC and uh, what we might do in the future. Yeah, thank you, Scott. Um, we were just talking about this with the team, the tsunami team yesterday at NOAA. Uh, we are kind of waiting to hear more about what the JCB will do. I think it, it's a little quiet for us right now. Um, I did get a chance to talk to some of the WMO folks that come to the IOC meetings when we were there in June. Uh, we are hearing more about ocean-related requirements, which is great. Um, and I think probably the next step will be to figure out what this new no longer the JCOM, now the JCB is going to be what how it's going to function. There seems to be some ambiguity around that. Um, and so we'll just be working with our WMO team to figure out how we can kind of get in there and start the conversation um, without precluding allowing others to start as well. Some of the tropical cyclone work that we've been doing in the United States is of high interest expanding that globally to the WMO. So I look forward to working with you on that. Thank you. Tony. Uh, yeah, thank you, Nicole. And it's great that you're um, back at the table and uh, uh, congratulations. Uh, mine are more directly related to the national committee work and try to, how do, how do we uh, continue to work on you? We've had good contact with Liz and others and, and, and active, but I feel like um, there's a new opportunity now with you active in IOC. And I just, how, how do we, uh, th there's two questions that have come up in the committee. And I think we're going to be talking about with some of our nexus organizations is how, um, you know, for, for the U S scientists and for the U S public who really isn't going to follow all of this, um, how do we really elevate um, what we try to do through essentially our, our ocean shots effort to elevate aspirations around ocean science, but also how do we engage a little bit more um, directly with some of your, interagency federal processes, the SOST, you know, other activities. So how can we as a national committee sort of elevate and and work with you to kind of elevate some of these issues and particularly kind of leading into maybe um, the meeting in, in Barcelona or any other specific opportunities that you see for us to work um, more with you to amplify what you're doing? Yeah, thank you, Tony. And I, uh, I think having a deadline like that of sorts, the meeting in Barcelona might not be a bad idea. Uh, because this is a this is an issue that we've been talking about and talking about. Um, there are multiple interagency bodies, this committee and others, and none of them have the great links to one another. We also uh, anticipate that the U.S. State Department will want to potentially restand up its UNESCO National Committee, and that there might be something for the IOC underneath that. Um, but what we've been trying to talk about on the IOC interagency team is what would be a better approach? What could we propose to link the SOS, to link this committee, to link whatever might be stood up under the UNESCO um, auspices? It's 
it's really hard to say there's, I don't think there's one answer, to be honest with you, because I've been asked several times, what is your recommendation? I think that these various bodies could make multiple choices and succeed, but I think we need to sit down and talk about it together and be deliberate about those choices so that we're not creating another body that doesn't connect with the existing bodies, even though I suspect, and it's not a bad news on its face, if the State Department says, let's stand back up your IOC body under UNESCO, right? That's not a bad thing, but it makes me kind of go, oh, another body. Um, so I, I think it would be worthwhile. And I'm, you know, I've talked to the team about it many times and we're all kind of like, I don't know, a lot of different things could work. Uh, I think maybe having a, a deadline for ourselves of having some ideas solidified uh, by that Barcelona meeting is, is something that we can shoot for and should shoot for um, internal to the IWG even even within the smaller team and i think there's maybe a the unesco meeting that happens in november i think might be a sort of a little bit of a of a point of entry for us to focus but also i just want to my understanding of the national our decade committee is also to, again to really help bring these issues out into the uh the the, the academic community and also the public a little bit more yeah. so let's give some thought to that very specific yes. mission that we have because again it's fine for us to come to these meetings, but but really to sort of really elevate this with the, those communities is something that we have on our list to do as well. No, and I appreciate that. Um, this was a, a bit of a, a personal anecdote. This was the first delegation I ever led that I had never sat on before. So it was a bit of a, what do I do? Um, even though I had been on many um, international or US delegations to international treaties and such. Um, and one of my very first questions was, what are we doing to make sure that we are representing fully, not just the other U.S. agencies, which we have a pipeline to, but also um, other members of the U.S. ocean community? And I think there's a lot of good intentions there. I can't imagine how difficult it's been with the stop and the start with UNESCO. And so it, I've been asking myself, what is different and more durable and I'm sure the State Department is going to say, you get to stand up a new IOC committee under the UNESCO. And, and that is not bad news inherently. But I think part of where I get a little mixed up is, is that the way to go? Because it up and down and up. And, anyway, that's a lot of words. We've been giving it a lot of words on the IWG. No one has a great one answer. That's the way to do it. But I would, I think we have to naturally engage this body in that conversation. And I'm just going to give myself the deadline of the Barcelona meeting for us to have at least a couple of solid ideas on the table because yeah thank you you bet okay we're going to take um one more question and because we're already over time <laughs> so um Frank Miller Carter welcome Frank yeah hello everybody good to see you all I wanted to um follow up on Tony's question and Nicole's presentation and I welcome Nicole's emphasis on having some some goalposts for the April meeting in Barcelona. And I'm gonna bring it up during my presentation. And, and one opportunity may be this Vision 2030 process that the Ocean Decade has, has uh, stood up. And several of us in the US are involved in, in the Vision 2030 process. Uh, one of the things that we would like to hear from you and, and we need some help with is in developing these goalposts and indicators on how the decade is progressing. And I think that's the weakest part of all of these writing teams. We're all writing white papers that have to be delivered by uh, by the Barcelona meeting. So that that's one ask that I have of Nicole and group uh, as we point to Barcelona. The other one is uh, building on Scott's uh, comment and I, I really was very interested in the dynamic between WMO and the IOC, because in addition to uh, those uh, those groups and efforts that are just mentioned, there's another one that is coming up, and that's the Global Greenhouse uh, Gas Watch, GGGW, which is still in a study group at the WMO. It's led by WMO, but it includes the IOC. And it's, a, it's an important opportunity there to get the ocean engaged in in an operational way in greenhouse gas uh, monitoring. And the GGGW goes beyond just measuring things in the air, but trying to understand and predict fluxes. And so for that, you need basics, chemistry, biology, and geology all together. And so I, I would, I, this is a heads up 
this is heating up and, and the implementation plan is being written. Thank you, Frank. Okay, well, thank you again, Nicole. I hope you have some time maybe to stay with us for a I'm little here. while. Yeah. Great, that's terrific. Um, so I wanna move on now uh, to the next part of our agenda, which is to talk about our Nexus organizations and as everyone in this room is aware, when we first stood up the U.S. National Committee, a big part of our mandate was to reach out to the U.S. ocean community more broadly. And one of the mechanisms that we identified was to create what we call the Ocean Decade Nexus and encouraged um, ocean organizations to sign up on our website. And we list all of those Nexus organizations on the website and then to participate in the, in the committee's activities. And so um, one of the things that we've been talking about quite a lot is how to engage our Nexus more effectively and, and to make use of this network. Um, we currently have a newsletter that we send out to the Nexus. We encourage them to send items to us, to um, post their events on our, in our calendar, but we think there may be some more opportunities out there. And so this next session is really designed to help us identify some of those opportunities. And I do want to mention that um, the other goal for the U.S. National Committee today is to really say, you know, what, where are we going with the decade? You know, what does success look like? Identify any wins that we have to date. And then also to say, are there opportunities out there that we should really recognize now and start acting on to make a difference during the decade? So I want everybody to kind of have that in the back of their mind as we go through um, the next couple of sessions. And the only other thing I'll, I'll mention since it came up, we've been talking quite a bit about the Barcelona meeting. And I encourage people to stay after the last talk um, today because we will have some time to then talk about, you know, do some real on the ground planning for the Barcelona meeting. Okay. Um, so now I'd like to um, turn it back to Frank, actually. I think you're the first up. And I don't know if, um, is Gabriella with us? She's on I am um, online, yes. Oh, great. So um, you're up on our next on our agenda, so you can take it away. Great, thank you. I assume I can share my screen. Let me try that. <clears throat> and let me know if you can see that, please. Yes, it's well, it's hasn't come up yet. Is it? Uh, okay, so there we go. Now it's in the room. Okay. <laughs> You're good there to you. go, Frank. Great. So this is one of the ocean shots that I, that we wrote uh, early on, and actually that also was endorsed as an ocean decade program, which is one of those overarching long term umbrellas for many different projects and activities under the ocean decade. So I'll give you a very, very short overview and uh, why we need this and then some of the suggestions that I have for how the US can be uh, more involved. So uh, I think that it, it's no secret that life is at the core of everything that we do, uh, even though we don't think about it sometimes in, in different disciplines. But uh, when we look at the essential ocean variables, many of them are needed to monitor and restoration or some type of recovery or management of marine life or, or ecosystems for managing or understanding greenhouse fluxes or food and nutrition production, water quality, or and so many other social relevant processes and ocean uses. And here's just an example illustrated as, as we think about how do you recover uh, or, or restore an ecosystem and we want to monitor success there's now many tools that we can use to to address that as opposed to not looking or or having some control uh, environment. So if we can think of eDNA or acoustics, imaging, satellite, remote sensing, and so on, uh, we can get a good picture of how things are are restoring or not. So, but we've known about how we've known that we need to incorporate biological observing into general ocean observing for decades. And the thing is that it, 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 we've tried to do this in little bits and pieces. Uh, the Global Ocean Observing System recognized this and has had it in its plan uh, all, the, all the way back when it was adopted by the IOC as, as Goose in 1991. 
the census of marine life uh, made a big dent in this and really moved things forward. But then it closed uh, after a decade in 2010. And those pieces were picked up by in the international community by the, by the Group on Earth Observations Biodiversity Observation Network or GEOBON. And we established um, the Marine Biodiversity Observation Network under that and several US agencies under the National Ocean Partnership Program uh, sponsored projects and pilots that still continue today. There's 10 pilots in the US that belong or follow the the guide, guidelines or build guidelines for MBON. MBON is also a tight partnership between the Global Ocean Observing System, the Ocean Biodiversity Information System, uh, in trying to move data. So one of the big things is interoperability and in, in trying to move data from the lab into, into the public. And these partners and a bunch of other partners, about 60 groups, got together and proposed Marine Life 2030 to the Ocean Decade back in 2020, and it was endorsed by the Ocean Decade in 2021. And it's a collaboration between the Ocean Bi uh, Biomolecular Observation Network, or the uh, ORS, which looks at ocean acidification, and many other programs, including OASIS, which I think is represented in the room today. But if we look at life and how in the measurements of life in the sea today, it still looks like this. Uh, and this is after a hundred and some years of records being included in the Ocean Biodiversity Information System, OBIS. Uh, the, it's very hard to track change and it's very hard to do that everywhere uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a sustained manner. And yet we want to make decisions about life and forecast life in a way that is uh, responsive to management needs and uh, including greenhouse gas management. So with a picture like this, how do we change the, the, the panorama? Today, we can include uh, biodiversity and other biological measurements in ocean observing if we put our head to it. For example, we can include, uh, there's many devices now that, that do optics of imaging for uh, from bacteria and, and other microorganisms to zooplankton and, and fish. We can do animal tracking. Uh, we can do acoustics, both passive and active. The genomics area is exploding with eDNA. There's many different platforms that we can use. Some of them are autonomous. Uh, models and forecasting are starting to be very good in biology, including in species distribution, but also in uh, biodiversity. And one area that we have a lot to gain with is in AI and in visualization of data. So one of the questions is how can the uh, National Ocean Decade Committee help define the vision for how we move data across this value chain uh, and integrate biology into ocean observing? So in defining the requirements and working with Goose and then in, in, in the integrated ocean observing system in the U.S. is the U.S part of GOOSE, so can we work through that channel? Uh, can we develop better observing uh, strategies in integrating instruments into these platforms? Can we have a better way to, and I think that this, this is one of the big challenges uh, in, in our society is moving data and information so that we can make decisions and, and enable this blue economy that we talk about, which is based on information. And so much biological data is not moving and, and has never moved. And this, this is uh, something that I think we can address. And then ha having synthesis and modeling and, and connecting the user back to the requirements through a, 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 an operational loop is very important. So we cannot build an operating system, an operational system on the research programs that we have right now. It has to be operational and it has to involve the stakeholders. So at present, these steps that you see here are not coordinated. They, there's really no convention on standards uh, for the community. There's no co coordination on capacity development and sharing for data management, especially, and the user is not really in the loop. And so there's, there's many things that we can do. The Ocean Decade has initiated the Ocean Vision 2030 process that we talked about recently. There's 10 working groups one per challenge, and I'm not gonna go through the challenges here, they're easy to find. Uh, these these uh, groups are supposed to write 
white papers that are going to be discussed and sort of set the tone for the conference in Barcelona. The whole conference is built around these uh, white papers. And there's many US scientists involved in the ocean decade and in writing these white papers. Here's some listed in the different working groups. Uh, three of the working groups have co-chairs that come from the US. And uh, I, I think that there's an opportunity here to engage with the National Decade Committee. There's a timeline, I'm not, I'm not gonna show it, but there is a, a, a possible a possibility being discussed of the uh, working groups meeting with the Ocean Decade in New Orleans at the Ocean Sciences meeting. That's not decided yet, uh, but the, the Ocean Decade uh, coordinating unit is discussing that. So the white papers have to, have to be basically done by January and polished by April. So the conversation topics that I bring here is that the ocean decade is about sustainable development and how you engage scientists and making this happen. And what I would like to see this national committee engaged in is helping the US play a, play a more prominent role in leading the ocean decade programs. Right now, uh, the US is sort of invisible in the, in the international ocean decade. So I think that we can change that without too much effort. Uh, linking stakeholders with the science groups that are involved in the Ocean Decade is one thing. Emphasizing science diplomacy is another area where the U.S. can really shine and, and uh, be involved in. I think one of the main things that we can help with is in coordinating education and capacity sharing or capacity building. Right now, all of these groups, that all of us that teach or educate in ocean sciences do it on our own. There's really no coordination on curricula, especially on how you move data and data standards and interoperability. This is a huge opportunity for the decade, and I think we should take advantage of that opportunity. The US can participate more actively in the Ocean Decade, Ocean Vision 2030 process. And I mentioned before, setting indicators and milestones and how, how we achieve these milestones in the next six years and then look beyond 2030. So looking at the ocean decade as a ramp to take off uh, for sustainable development into the future is, is where we need support. The, the uh, UN decade, the, the US National Committee can also help uh, uh, peer review of these programs and programs that the ocean decade uh, has a rolling, a rolling process to solicit uh, for and we are asked as programs and projects to peer review this. There's no formal process established there, and this is something that the academy has uh, experience with, and all of you in in national agencies have great experience with. So we can support that that peer review process. And there's also ultimately what we all ask for is the support of endorsed actions, actions endorsed by the UN Decade are all volunteer. There's no support so far for any of these. And it's um, three years have gone by almost completely now. And all of this is, um, uh, and this is where, where we are. You know? we, we have uh, a, an opportunity that if we don't pay attention, we'll be missed. One way to do this, and I think that Nicole being now uh, representing us at the IOC is a, a very important thing to get us back in the game is uh, working with the U IOC and other UN focal points to advance ocean science for sustainable development. I think that we don't, even the IOC doesn't make enough use of linking with the, for example, the Global Ocean Observing System and focal points in making this happen. So uh, I, I think that we should get a mandate from the focal points to do ocean observing. So the decade is an opportunity. Uh, we should take advantage of it. If, uh, if we don't pay attention, it'll be gone in a blink, just like many, many other UN decades. So these are our contacts, Gabriel Canonico and myself, our colleagues of Marine Life 2030, and sort of what I talked about is what our focus is. And thank you. No, thank you, Frank. And um, we'll take maybe one question out. We're running a little behind schedule, so. If anyone wants to follow up with Frank. Uh, Lynn. 
yeah, I can't talk into this. Uh, thank you so much. I think you've articulated in a very calm and diplomatic way concerns I've had about our directions um, and um, engagement with the UN decade process. And I think it is high time we really focus on this. Um, I really appreciate your inclusion of the Global Ocean Observing System as part of um, the process going forward. Um, not everything has to be absolutely novel. Um, which has been kind of the focus for several years. Um, and so anyway, I just wanted to say I appreciate your talk and um, I hope that the, we can move forward this way. Okay, so I'm sorry, we're gonna have to move on. Um, the next on our list is Oasis and that's Masha Edmonton. And Masha, do you have slides to present? I do, I can present them myself or whichever is easier. Yeah, okay. go ahead. Yeah, right. we'll, we'll make sure you can share. Okay, perfect. Um, so thank you um, to the Ocean Studies Board and National Committee for inviting OASIS to speak today. My name is Masha Edmondson. I'm from the Center for Ocean Leadership at UCAR that provides programmatic support for the UN Ocean Decade Program Observing Air-Sea Interaction Strategy, otherwise known as OASIS. It's co-led by Megan Cronin, Krista Miranda, and Seb Swart, who could not be here today due to a European holiday and also a sabbatical on a field research crew. So we're very busy over here. Um, so the OASIS um, aims to quantify ocean atmosphere fluxes, including ocean uptake of CO2 as called for by the Paris Agreement. The ocean influences weather and climate through fluxes or heat, moisture, momentum, particles, and gases. And without this air-sea fluxes, the ocean would be pretty static. So OASIS aims to improve the coupling between the ocean and atmosphere and earth system models, and thereby the information and forecast from these models. So through these ocean oceanic and atmospheric observations, we can improve forecasts of weather, climate, and the ecosystem. So at the Ocean 19, Ocean Ops 19 conference, the first grand idea for OASIS was formed, which is that we need a globally distributed network of air sea observing platforms built around an expanded array of time series stations. And as our OASIS community formed, we identified consensus that we need to, grand idea number two, optimize satellites for air-sea fluxes and ensure that we're improving boundary layer observing. And grand idea number three, we need to improve understanding of air-sea interaction processes and improve the air-sea coupling models. So these are the three pillars that underpin the objectives for this decade program. And this is driven by the community based off those Ocean Ops 19 white papers that are listed on the screen in the triangle. Um, so the vision is um, to improve in situ satellite data and models, which will then lead to improved ocean information and earth system forecasts, serving stakeholders around the world and help contribute to UN decade goals. So OASIS is driven by this theory of change where we need to work together across disciplines and across the world, including the global south and big ocean states. We intend to do this by developing a culture of partnerships and mentorship. So to dive into how we are addressing these grand ideas, the first is expanding the observation network. It's focused on building global capacity through curriculum development, data sharing, webinars, summer schools, and mentoring. And these quotes on the slide showcase our ECOP leadership within the OASIS community driving these ideas. So we're also trying to address current gaps in air-sea observations, and notably we'll have a large presence at the upcoming Ocean Science Meeting in 2024, and would love to invite you to our town halls that will dive into emerging opportunities for air-sea fluxes from space. Um, we're also utilizing the OASIS community to develop findable, interoperable, and reasonable data, models, and products to create a predictable ocean, as well as create endorsed community best practices by bringing air-sea interaction practitioners from around the world and provide open access resources to the community on best practices. So some accomplishments of OASIS today are community webinars. We host several webinars to engage and educate the community, such as uncrewed surface vehicles for GOOSE or the Global Ocean Observing System, the UN Ocean Decade Satellite Events, air sea fluxes, best practices, capacity building, and other workshops. We also provide education to the younger generation through the SOLAS Summer School curriculum, where members from our community will come and help build the curriculum for the summer school course, as well as come and teach lessons and teach activities. 
Um, we also have community-based publications on air-sea interactions, um, which uh, includes uh, uh, publications on our website at airseaobs.org. Um, we also can be seen um, at multiple conferences with presentations at SOLAS, AGU, EUROC, the Ocean Science Meeting, um, the UN Ocean Conference, AMS, and others. And lastly, OASIS is engaged in community collaboration through our theme teams, and they're focused on best practices and interoperability, fair data and models, observing network design and model improvements, partnerships and capacity, and international efforts. Um, so there's a lot of hope and appreciation for seeing the full value chain of ARC interaction research, and the UN Decade endorsement has definitely provided some connective tissue and some leverage for us. So it's helped international collaborations, it's helped with cross-discipline research, allowing us to connect with energy, water, carbon, life cycles, and earth system modeling, as well as make connections between in situ observations, satellites, models, and forecasts, and also helping this theory of change make a cultural shift. There are four key areas where OASIS is looking for support. Um, the Ocean Decade is a bottom-up science process at the moment, so we could use the National Committee's help with getting funding to support workshops, websites, ECOPS, other efforts, and we could also use some top-down guidance associated with this potential funding to keep us focused. Um, we'd also uh, encourage the National Committee to work with the Decade Office to streamline the reporting process, which I know most people are aware of is pretty onerous and time consuming, so a little more guidance on that would be great. Um, the National Committee could also issue some best practices on how to engage with the DCC and DCOs, which are the Decade Collaborative Centers and Decade Coordination Offices, um, to help with programs. OASIS is a member of both for the Ocean Ops community, but it's still kind of unclear. There their support role with our program, how often we should be engaging with them, how often we should be reaching out. Um, and lastly, the National Committee could request more detailed information regarding the projects associated with these programs. Um, there are requirements and opportunities that we are just unaware of at the moment, and we would love to engage better with projects joining our program. Um, so if you'd like to join our community, you can visit our website here and stay apprised of all that we're doing. And thank you again to the Ocean Study Boards and the National Committee for inviting us to speak today and happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you very much, Masha. Um, first off, I'll say, you know, if anybody has a question, please raise your hand. And let's see, Rosie, go ahead, Rosie. I think you're on mute. Okay, can you hear me now or no? Yes. Okay, um, so your presentation was really great in emphasizing um, operationalization of FAIR principles. Um, can you speak to how you're working towards operationalizing CARE principles? for indigenous data sovereignty? Yeah, so um, at the moment, OS is in a, in a current restructuring of our organization. So we're having a meeting right before um, the ocean science meeting where we're meeting with the community and bringing them to New Orleans. Um, so that way we can better like engage in everything else that we need to talk on. And care principles is definitely one that we want to add to our fair principles theme team. Um, so currently not in, the works at the moment, but we're planning on doing that starting in December. Great, thanks. Yeah, thank you, Masha. And I'll just make one comment is that um, for the US National Committee, we uh, we can certainly share concerns um, with the Decade Coordination Unit about the reporting, but we don't make decisions on, on the reporting process, yeah. So if you had maybe even if you, you know, probably the more specific the recommendation was on the reporting, um, the more effective that communication will be. Okay, um, and our next speaker is Pat Glibert. Um, she's the current president of ASLO. And Pat, are you ready? I am. Uh, All right. And uh, oh. Safa, um, I sent you some slides. Yes, indeed. So I'm Pat Glibert, a professor with the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science, but I'm here today as the president of ASLO 
the Association for the Sciences of Limnology and Oceanography. Um, just to introduce you to our mission, ASLO fosters a diverse international scientific community that creates, integrates, and communicates knowledge across the full spectrum of aquatic sciences, advances public awareness and education about aquatic resources and research, and promote scientific stewardship of aquatic resources for the public interest. We're a society of about 3,500 members and uh, more than 50% of our membership is international. Um, so we are no longer the American Society of Limnology and Oceanography. If about 20% of our members identify as early career and another 30% as students. So we have quite an engaged membership, international membership, and young and upcoming membership. Um, next slide, please. I think you're all well aware of what ASLO does in the realm of conferences. Um, we've heard already reference to the Ocean Sciences meeting coming up in February. Um, this is an endorsed um, decade action program. It is co-sponsored by AGU and the Oceanography Society. And there will be several um, sessions and workshops, et cetera, um, with regard to um, the ocean decade. Um, our following conference is going to be in June in Madison, and that will be an ASLO only um, conference. But we um, fully embrace at all aspects of our conferences, partnerships in basic and applied science while making scientific and social connections. Next slide. And I think you're all well aware of our uh, great journals, um, LNO, LNO Letters, which is our um, journal for shorter communications, LNO methods and our bulletin. Um, we are working and we are on track for having these journals fully open access um, within a little over a year. Um, this transition is ongoing and that's our timeline. I just wanted to point out a couple of recent special issues or virtual issues that have relevance to some of the things we've already talked about today. Um, an LNO special issue on autonomous instrumentation and big data, and a LNO methods virtual issue on machine and deep learning. So our special issues in addition to all of our regular contributed papers um, really help to highlight a lot of these issues. Next, next slide. I wanted to also make you aware of some of the programs that um, are perhaps not as front and center in your mind when you think of ASLO. And one is um, a program that we've been offering now for the past couple of years, which is our near monthly webinar series called Amplifying Voices. And this webinar series is designed to showcase the work of early career researchers around the world, particularly in places where uh, they would not ordinarily have the finances to attend um, a regular conference. So we've had many fabulous presentations from India, Singapore, Morocco, South Africa, Brazil, Colombia, um, you name it. Um, and these are really wonderful presentations and wonderful opportunities to showcase the work of these great early career researchers. Next. We take pride in expanding opportunities uh, for our students and early career researchers. And I'm only gonna highlight two programs here. One is the ASLO Multicultural Program, which has been running since 1990 um, and now has supported more than 1400 students from over 250 different institutions. Uh, it originally was termed the ASLO Minority Program. It's now the Multicultural Program. 
this past uh, June for our meeting in Mallorca, we brought 100 students um, and they were fully paid for and fully engaged in the meeting. This program is run in collaboration with Hampton University. Another um, program that we have developed recently, and this comes out of the um, fact of life that publication is expensive and publication is gonna to continue to be expensive, especially as we transition to open access research or publications. Um, and this is our early career publication honor. Uh, we offer a waiver of publication fees for open access. For those, um, it, it is an application um, from those from the Global South, Ukraine, or other underrepresented groups. And we can offer a select number of these uh, publication waivers, but students and early career uh, professionals receive not only a waiver of publication fees, but manuscript guidance along the process. So um, we hope that we will be able to expand this um, in the years to come. And next, another program that ASLO runs and has run for um, more than a decade, and yet um, is probably not well known to many, is our Global Outreach and Education Program. And in this program, we offer small grants on the order of two to three thousand uh, dollars for projects to communicate aquatic science to non-technical audiences. And we've just selected the five projects that will receive funding for this year. And you can see the titles here, but importantly, um, we are supporting programs in Northern Mariana Islands, Mexico, Nepal, Ghana, and Nigeria. And the map shows where projects have been funded in our previous years. We run this program um, at this time every other year. So next slide. So what does success look like? Um, return to our ASLO mission, which is for the creation, integration, and communication of knowledge across the full spectrum of aquatic sciences, advancement in public awareness and education about aquatic resources and research, and promotion of scientific steward stewardship uh, for the public interest. So thank you very much. Thank you, Pat. Um, do you have time to take a question or two? Sure. Okay. Does anyone? I'm looking for any hands. Okay. Um, well, I'll ask. I'll ask a, a favor, perhaps. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, one of the things, of course, as the U.S. National Committee, is we really want to be able to engage the community, and so I'm wondering if there are opportunities to work with ASLA to get our message out about any decade opportunities to your community. Oh, there... I think that's that's um, a wonderful um, opportunity and we can um, continue to have that conversation with our communications director, but also um, opportunities to promote um, all of these activities uh, through articles in our bulletin um, and we can, we can work together with you um, to make that happen. That sounds great. Um, I have one other, um, this is just a quick question, and that is for these special issues, are, are those open access? Uh, at, the current time, open access? at the current time, uh, the select papers are open access as the authors chose to do so. Um, as I said, we're going to move forward in the future for all of our papers to be open access. But at the current time, um, we are running basically hybrid where um, authors can choose to pay the extra fee to have it open access or not. So um, we can we can look to see which papers 
are open or not. Okay, thank you very much. Um, let's see, I don't see any hands up right now, so maybe we'll move on and then we'll have some time maybe for discussion. So uh, David Miller, you're up next. Uh, are you ready? Great. See the screen? Can you hear me okay? Yes. Good. Yeah, so thanks very much for the opportunity to, to be here today and to uh, present to this uh, to this group. I'll be uh, coming at this, I guess, from a little different perspective, speaking um, as a company as opposed to a, a program. Um, but our, our company is uh, very, very active in the UN Ocean Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development and wanted to share, firstly, some context on our motivation and uh, also um, kind of the various activities um, that we're, we're actively involved with. So firstly, you may not be familiar with, with Fugro. I, I'm not sure who is or is not, but we are a multinational corporation that is headquartered in the Netherlands, um, but we operate uh, globally with offices in 60 countries. Um, including the U.S., where we have um, U.S. businesses and approximately 1,200 employees. Uh, we are a data company, um, and we are providing these data to our clients, both private and public sectors, to de-risk and manage their infrastructure development and natural resource uh, development programs. We're active in three main sectors. Uh, we're uh, supporting the transition um, with regards to energy, uh, we're involved with the development of sustainable infrastructure, and we're active in climate change adaptation and mitigation. We're a purpose-driven company. Our purpose is to help create a safe and livable world. The, the insights that we provide uh, to our clients uh, come from this AAA approach where we acquire data, we analyze data, and provide advice to our clients on, on the data. So. Uh, of not just a data collector, but uh, analytics as well as uh, advice uh, and insights. So the translation from data to information to knowledge. We have many resources and competencies, uh, specialized platforms, expertise to support ocean science, and we're conducting ocean science every day all over the world uh, for our uh, clients, like I say, both in the public and private sector. You can see some of those resources here, uh, but they fully support obviously um, ocean observation uh, as well as ocean mapping, uh, including surface, uh, med ocean buoys, um, ocean seafloor, ocean landers. We have um, 27 specialized uh, vessels. We have now a fleet of on a growing fleet of uncrewed surface vessels, uh, remotely operated vehicles, and autonomous underwater vehicles. Uh, a lot of this now being enabled and managed through remote operation centers. A lot of words on this uh, slide, but I, I think it's really important for you to see um, just how active a private sector company is in the ocean decade. We were involved um, in the very early days in the planning process. So in, in the open consultative meetings that were held to help plan the decade, uh, we were involved in many of these uh, regional meetings and were often the only, if not one of a few private sector uh, actors in, in the room. Um, that has translated into active participation now in the implementation of the decade. Uh, we have a partnership with IOC UNESCO and it's largely formed around transforming access to and sharing ocean data. Again, we're we're a data company, um, and we see great uh, great synergies in our support of of the decade in the area of, of ocean data. We're a member of the Ocean Decade Alliance, uh, which, if you're familiar with that, is by invitation only for those um, key 
contributors to the decade. So we are actually seconding personnel to IOC UNESCO in Paris um, with an in-kind contribution. And that, um, that seconded person is leading two working groups under the Ocean Decade. One is the, uh, the Ocean Decade Data Coordination Group. You may have seen a data uh, and information strategy that was produced by the decade in June that was produced by this working group. Uh, and then the other is the Ocean Decade Corporate Data Group, which is uh, a group of um, private companies that have come together to uh, create frameworks and mechanisms to provide public access to private data. Our CEO co-chairs that corporate data group with the IOC Executive Secretary. Um, we have appointed members, a member to the data coordination group. We have an appointed member to the data strategy implementation group. Uh, we have appointed member on working group eight uh, of the Ocean Decade Vision 2030 initiative that Frank mentioned. Uh, appointed member to the African and adjacent island states Ocean Decade Task Force, which produced the Africa Roadmap that Nicole mentioned. Uh, appointed member to the 2024 Ocean Decade Program Committee. We're actively involved with three endorsed uh, programs of the Ocean Decade, um, and, and that's growing, but the uh, the Seabed 2030 project, Ditto, Digital Twin of the Ocean, and Coast Predict. We're active in all of those uh, programs. We've also um, leading a consortium for a digital twin early warning system that was accepted as an officially endorsed uh, project of the Ocean Decade uh, in the fourth call. We also have employees that are active in ECOPS, and we've actually initiated an ECOPS group within FUGRO uh, globally. So you've seen that we're a data company. You've seen our all-in approach here on, on the decade. Um, I, I think from a private sector perspective, the, the private sector is not always visible in, in the decade, but um, important uh, collaborator and partner. So. You know, the motivation here, information as a currency of progress, um, supporting sustainable development, uh, as well as driving innovation. So these are kind of, I would say, umbrella motivations from a private sector perspective. Looking more specifically at uh, Fugro um, and the direct and indirect benefits of our participation, we obviously see business opportunities. Um, the hope and expectation is this will create this UN decade will create a, create awareness and prioritize funding to further expand ocean science and the private sector can be a partner in that process. It improves access uh, for ocean science data. We use public source data every day in our business, um, improving the density, uh, the resolution, and the coverage of that will only enhance um, the services that we we provide. Um, engagement, it allows us to have very thoughtful conversations uh, and engagement with our employees, our suppliers, our clients, and our shareholders. We are a publicly traded company. Um, it supports our sustainability agenda. We have um, uh, sustainability program in, in the company, and this is a key pillar of that sustainability program. Uh, ESG reporting is becoming increasingly important, particularly in, in Europe, where it's um, kind of leading the charge. Uh, there's also potential tax benefits here for participation. This hasn't been our motivation. We have not exercised this yet, but it is potentially um, a, a motivation. And then reputation benefits. I think for us, it's very important to be uh, living and um uh, supporting our our purpose of helping to create a live, safe and livable world, and we're doing that through our support of the decade. So aspirations for the ocean decade, um, these are from our perspective and maybe a private sector perspective, which could admittedly be quite different uh, than, than others. Um, but we see the ocean decade will have raised awareness of the critical importance of ocean health, sustainability, and prosperity of the planet and significantly increased funding of ocean science to reverse the cycle of decline in ocean health and support the development of sustainable ocean economy. Have the private sector seen as a meaningful partner and collaborator in this endeavor whose resources, competencies, and expertise are truly appreciated 
and who is involved in the co-design, co-development of impactful solutions that leverage public-private and public-private academic partnerships. And the private sector is at the table with governments, NGOs, and the finance investment community to ensure that ocean data, information, and knowledge is available to sufficiently de-risk and stimulate investment in the ocean and ocean science and technology. So that's my presentation. Hopefully, uh, <laughs> yeah, thank some you. time available for, for questions. Yeah, um, Heather, I see you've got your hand up. Go, go ahead. Yeah, um, so you mentioned uh, why you, you're involved, and I'm interested in if you could say a little bit more about the initial involvement with the decade, about how you actually started to get involved in the first place. It's a long story. It's a long, windy story that actually starts um, with Craig McLean around Seabed 2030. <laughs> uh, um, we had conversations um, at the Forum for Future Ocean Floor Mapping in Monaco in 2016, which was the precipitation of Seabed 2030. And we saw an opportunity for Fugro participation. This was actually a fill in a philanthropic sense. We saw that we had ships moving around the world um, and that we could be contributing data uh, to that program through simply logging data during those transits. It started simply there with one ship in the Americas in the US um, that grew. We've now got nine vessels involved. We've contributed 2.6 million square kilometers of bathymetry to seabed 2030. But that action saw demonstrated leadership when the ocean decade was then starting to organize. They leaned on us for, um, for demonstrating similar leadership and bringing our perspective to the, uh, to the table. Um, and that led to wanting to scale up, not just Fugro participation, but other industry actors. Uh, and that led to our partnership with IOC and the formation of the Decade Quarter Coordination Group, where we have now very serious um, multinational companies at the table working with us to get public access to private, private data. I don't know if that answers your question, but that's, that's it, was a, it was not necessarily by design. You know, seven years ago, it was a path uh, that we created um, through conversations and uh, participation. Okay, um, yeah, I'm sorry, I won't be able to take more questions right now because we're behind schedule, but certainly you can use the chat perhaps to um, pose your questions and maybe our speakers will have a chance to get back to you. Um, so now we have Heather Spence and she's gonna talk about the Ocean Memory Project. Thanks, and, and thanks for inviting the Ocean Memory Project to be part of this. Uh, I guess I could say it now for something a little different. <laughs> um, so I, yeah, again, I'm, I'm Heather Spence. I co-lead the Ocean Memory Project along with Jody Deming, who is a member of the National Academy, uh, and Daniel Cohn, who is a visual artist. Uh, I myself uh, am a marine biologist. Uh, many of you already know me through my work in uh, the interagency space. Uh, I, I wear a number of hats, uh, including uh, I co-chair the interagency working group on ocean sound and marine life. And through that, uh, I'm quite involved in the ocean decade space with our endorsed program on uh, the, the uh, maritime acoustic environment. All that to say, and part of why I asked my question is I think one thing that I think is important to remember is that the uh, I think the ocean decade can be a little bit confusing uh, for those who are outside of the loop. And so uh, one of the reasons why the Ocean Memory Project has been able to participate in this process is because I'm able to help demystify that. Um, and I think that's one of the, the points that I want to make is that I think it's really important to think about who the players are in this space and think how do we reach the people who aren't really sure how to get involved, what it even means to get involved. So um, with that, I'll, I'll give a little bit of information about what is the Ocean Memory Project. So this was actually born at a National Academies event. So I'm curious, um, who here is familiar with the 15 year experiment that was the National Academy's Keck Futures Initiative. Okay, so, <laughs> so 
so a few, but this was a a really cool, uh, successful experiment. Uh, basically, working to promote uh, transdisciplinary collaboration in the sciences, and at towards the end of the fifteen years also brought in disciplines outside of the sciences and the arts and humanities. And, uh, oh, thanks. <laughs> so, uh, and so each year there was a different theme. Uh, in 20, I think it was 16, there was, there was a theme, the Deep Blue Sea, and there was a conference and a resulting, uh, and after the conference, there was funding available for projects coming out of that at the conference, which was not your average science conference. Uh, it was very collaborative and hands-on. Uh, this idea emerged of, does the ocean have memory? This was a very provocative question and scientists got excited about it. Artists got excited about it. Um, all these interesting dialogues came out of just that seemingly simple question. But when you put together that idea of ocean and memory, you really start to imagine a lot of interesting things that you could explore with that. And so uh, several projects got funded uh, in the ocean memory space. And then in the final year of NACFI, there was a challenge grant that anyone from any of the years was uh, could, could apply to be that. And the ocean memory project was thrilled to be funded as one of only three projects uh, that were funded in that challenge grant. So, so that's the origin, but what do we do since then? Well, we've really been forming a community and when people ask me, well, what is what is ocean memory? What is the ocean memory project? I could define for you ocean memory in a number of different ways. I can say, well, we are exploring ocean memory uh, as thinking about it as a concept of how memories can be stored in the ocean, not just in biotic resources, but also could can memories be stored in in a parcel of water? Uh, how are these memories recall can be recalled? Uh, how does this relate to ocean sustainability, but I think the really at the heart of it is Ocean Memory Project is a community of people who have very different perspectives on this topic, all working together quite successfully and integratively. This is not just a project where we're taking science and art and jamming them together by saying, okay, science has finished. Let's tell an artist about this science and the artist is going to create some art about it and help make the public more aware about this issue. That's a very fine thing to do. But in Ocean Memory Project, it's actually about having everybody come together at the process stage. And so it's, it's really creating projects where everyone is involved in the creation of that project and the methodology of that project. And how is that gonna get, how's that gonna come to fruition? So, and we've had uh, a lot of different events, conferences, workshops, discussion groups, both in person and we had to adapt as we all did during the pandemic to having things fully online. Um, and we also have given out seed grants to many different projects to work on this topic. So we've one of the things we're working on now is developing, uh, basically writing out and publishing <laughs> methodologies that we've developed for how to do this kind of transdisciplinary planning for events, uh, discussions, publications, granting. And so that's something where I think maybe Ocean Memory Project could be engaged more in the ocean decade to see how can we really expand who can be part of this conversation. Because I think some of the methods that we've created could really help us do that. Um, and I'll say too, the group started in the US, but uh, we have international participation. Um, actually, uh, you mentioned the um, the uh, the Io Caribe region, and I saw it only had seven endorsed projects, which sort of surprised me. And one of those projects is actually involved with Ocean Memory Project. And it was partially through their involvement in the project that they were able to figure out how to get endorsement for, for that to the UN. So, um, you know, it's 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 quite a bit of effort to, to be part of the decade. And so, I would like to see are there ways that we can, 
make demystify the process um, and get some more people involved? And is there a role for Ocean Memory Project to help us do that, help us reach out to additional communities, help us think about engaging a variety of disciplines, maybe in some new ways? And um, and I, I mean, I, there's more that I could say, but I think that's, I, I'd love to hear if anybody has any questions. So I want to, I'll, I'll stop there and I'll say that we do have a website. It's oceanmemoryproject.org. So if you want to check out more about what we're doing or get in touch, uh, you can check us out there. Well, thank you so much, Heather. Um, do we have maybe one or two questions for Heather? Anyone? Well, I, I, you know, I, I will say, at least for um, for the U.S. National Committee, we will certainly take you up on your offer for reaching out to the community and, and enhancing engagement. I can see it's a really important part of the role of the U.S. National Committee, so I see some opportunities there. Anyone else? Liz? Good to see you, Heather. Um, Likewise. Uh, just wanted to note that, uh, you know, as an interagency working group, as we even recruit within the federal and within and across federal agencies for ocean decade actions, because we want to show up to this party we invited everybody to. And I don't mean by the United States did it alone, but indeed we were part of the, the folks who came up with this brainchild, right? And so it's important for us to not only be there, but be effective in this space. And I think we've struggled sometimes with making sure folks understand that even the, though the big pot of money has not yet appeared for Ocean Decade endorsed things, it's still important to seek endorsement. And I think some of the things that you described that Ocean Memory Project has experienced, some of the things that David mentioned relative to like the benefits uh, companies can experience out of being involved in something like an Ocean Decade, I think is, is crucial to do. And so if there's a way perhaps that our interagency team can work with the National Committee and your group in particular to rethink how we demystify things, how we make the case that this is indeed important and necessary and useful. Um, I'm looking forward to talking more about how maybe we can do that. So thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks. These are all great. Um, and, and if people are tra tracking the chat, um, it is incredibly robust and really underscores to me the fact that we're not having these discussions on a consistent basis ongoing because I feel like, you know, the connections are being made literally in this sort of informal fora as a result of this. So that's just one thing I want to observe. And so I do think uh, I want to think about that. The other thing is I'm just really, you know, putting it on the table that as the National Decade Committee, we're trying to figure out not all the eaches, but really how we can really more effectively make these types of connections in a sustained way with some sustained outcomes. So again, very supportive of Liz's idea that seek endorsement, but that's this thing that's happening out there in the international world. I mean, I'm getting announcements from the IU's national, from the international committee about things. And I'm like, well, I had no idea that was even going on. So, so, so I, I do think endorsements, I don't want to undercut that, but again, we're the national committee. We are really thinking about U.S. leadership in this regard, not only as a participant in the decade, which is through some of their official nodes, but also leveraging those official decades to be sure that we at the U.S. through our academic partners are, are leading and we are connecting and also maybe sending a message, which is once you get get recognized, that doesn't mean you're outside the decade if you're not recognized. And I feel like as a national committee, maybe that's a bit of a focus that we might think about, like Oslo's doing X, Y, and Z. They don't have to be a recognized committee to 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 be able to make feel like they are contributing to the US and the national commitment to that. So again, I just put that challenge out there. So I am kind of asking us as a committee to think, but also you all who contributed these great discussions, we think, so what, as a national committee, you know, how we can do that, you know, Dave, the works that you're doing, I'm kind of familiar with it. I kind of probably tracking it more than other people, but but then, so what, what is the US, as the National Decade Committee, can we even downsize some of your efforts or really make sure we're nesting uh, what you're doing, you know, even domestically in some other ways into these these international commitments. So anyway, just, just a, a thought that I think that gets back to operationally where we discussed, started with Nicole, which is how do we then work more with the interagency committees? I'm looking at four other interagency SAS committees that have been in the chat, right? That I'm like, you know, one on acoustics and there's one on this. And so, yeah, I feel like there's being something missed 
there for us a little bit. Again, it's just maybe us not being aware, but but I, I do feel like this is for me a loop back to really sort of we as a committee reconfirming our mission, reconfirming our value added um, to this this enterprise, which is doing lots of fantastic things, but it's still a bit um, uh, not not specific enough in my mind to say what 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 do I want to take away from this and do next as a committee member. But mm -hmm. uh, just some thoughts. And I think at this time, it, you know, we can open up the discussion. So not speaker specific, but more open in terms of, you know, both uh, how the community, um, I would think the Nexus community can work with the U.S. National Committee and vice versa. What can the U.S. National Committee do? And I guess one one thought that I had, you know, hearing some of your your presentations was to think about if you have a win, you know, something where you really see you you know, something's accomplished for the decade, you can share that with us and we can feature it both in our newsletter and on our website. So we would certainly love to get that kind of feedback from the community and, and from our Nexus organizations. Okay. Thank you, Sue. And, and thanks to each of the presenters. Uh, Nicole, congratulations on, on the seat mm -hmm. that you now have. And David, thank you for being a leader and for Food Row being a leader. And um, I have to say, as a, not an observer, but also a collaborative participant at the time, and for those of you who don't know, I'm retired now, so I'm, I'm personally speaking for myself, although for the record, I do have an engagement with the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution part-time, because I am retired. <laughs> but, but I will say that Fugro entered this, not in, at least to my visibility, not as a speculative business opportunity, but as a motivated, conscious and um, conscience bearing commercial enterprise, but not for, not just for profit and for business opportunities. It was deemed the right thing to do. Fugro is doing today what US federal agencies don't do, which is run their acoustic data acquisition devices during transits. And so for a commercial company to have the vision and wisdom to go ahead and do this, and yet we're not fully compliant on the federal side, I think there's a wake up call amongst uh, various federal agencies here. So, so that's point one, let's follow industry. But number two, let's better figure out, and Tony, for the, for the committee, there are legislated instruments like the National Ocean Partnership Program, which has not fully utilized in implementation the invitation for the commercial sector to come in and be a welcomed partner rather than to have to fight their way into what has become the too often practiced norm of put out a BAA, a broad agency announcement, send me your pre-proposal, send me a proposal, we do a, a, a an NSF styled review, as opposed to just finding the collaborations immediately and going to work. And the law allows that. So the question is, why aren't we implementing that? I think the answer to that is if we go back to the SOST, and I'll take blame for that because I was a SOST co-chair. I know we have SOST members on the phone too. So I'll take the responsibility and not shed it to anyone else. But the SOST is, is, is borderline feckless when it comes down to implementing the, I'm sorry? retired now so yeah. i or it's like feckless well, or, 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 or jumping but, into your your well tony when i was active you knew i didn't bite my tongue either so but <laughs> but nonetheless we we and the reason it is is because no one's in charge at the sost we have four co-chairs god bless them the most patient people in the world but none of them has the ultimate authority to move and compel the direction of priorities and spending and until you get that we're going to continue to have the coalition of the willing sitting around and once again conjure, how could we do A, B, and C? So the, the problem is not with the SOS. The problem is the way the SOS is set up, that no one is in charge to compel a particular direction. You just have to, to recruit and incorporate the coalition of the willing. That's what, to me, makes it feckless. It doesn't achieve anywhere near what it should and could do. But then the last thing, which would be what I'm hearing today from the report outs of, of several of the programs or projects is activities, but it's not clear towards what strategy. And I can't sell activities and ask for money to do more activities. I want more websites. I want more ECOPS engagement. I want more. I don't think so. That's not resonating with someone who's going to write a check for you. Who's going to write the check? Maybe the Congress, maybe the private sector, maybe philanthropy. But what I think we need to, to do, and I would encourage the national committee to be thinking along these lines, is to characterize, number one, how much money do we have 
to do what on each program and project? Get an inventory. And, and Liz, maybe you you have this um, in development, but how much money do we have in order to do A, B, C, D, and E, but I only have Y dollars and I need X dollars? Where's my gap? I think that's an important understanding in order to make the measure of how well is the United States doing in, in taking a leadership role, taking a participatory role in the UN decade. Yeah, Frank's comment was, was concerning, but I know it's widely accepted amongst the members, of, some of the members of this committee that, that uh, the U.S. is, I think, Frank, I think you said U.S. is invisible internationally, and, and we need to be putting money there. So where do we get the money? The federal agencies, it's pretty hard to take it out of hide. But there are supplements that were passed through with the BIL and, and the um, IRA, and hopefully some of that can be materialized and applied. I look forward to that. And if there's an ability to give an accounting of that, I think that would help dear federal agencies. That would help this committee understand what that future looks like. But the other point is, is when you sell, you got to sell to the Congress also, because the federal agencies, if it's not in the president's budget, Congress isn't going to pick it up. So we need to be getting that in both sides. So I've thrown a lot of stuff up and out on the table, but I think strategy is more important than activities that we could report on because that really isn't getting us closer to an understanding of how well we're doing with a decade. Last comment, go back. If you haven't looked at it, look at the international um, ocean exploration decade, the international decade of ocean exploration is 50 years old. It started with an appropriation in the United States Congress the IOC reps took it to the IOC and said, hey, look what we're willing to start. Who's going to join us? Other countries came and joined. That's U.S. leadership, but we're not there right now. We know what's going on up the street in, in Congress. They're dealing with, with many distractions rather than the, the work for the people. But it it's something that gave rise to many activities that continue today. So don't feel that you have to look at finishing something by the end of the decade. I think we'd be comfortable recognizing a three-year budget planning process to start something within the decade and have it get legs and persist and carry on. Look at many oceanographic campaigns that do that. Thank you for your forbearance. Um, I see, sorry, Deponia, is that correct? Has his hand up or her hand up? Yeah, it is uh, Dipanjana. Deepanjana, thank you. <laughs> go, go ahead. Yeah, it's a. Uh, uh, my question is to, uh, for, for I mean, how uh, do you think this data acquisition system uh, is making a difference in the blue economy? I, could you state again who the your questions, your question, and who it's directed towards? Yeah, I was thinking that uh, I was uh, listening about this uh, different. I mean, thinking about the, how the money can be get them um, for the for uh, Mr. David Miller, that how uh, the blue economy and the data acquisition can uh, is making a difference in this uh, your in the blue economy. Thanks for the question. Um, uh, I, I think there's a couple of layers there, right? I, and I'm not sure which you're referring to, but if from a data coordination group perspective, right, this is kind of creating the digital ecosystem for the decade. This will be uh, basically the plumbing behind the scenes that will allow data to be discovered, accessed, and become interoperable. Uh, so you can imagine that that's a big challenge when you're talking about all of the ocean science data globally. There's many different types of ocean science data, and it's all collated <laughs> in various scales at, at various locations. I think there's over 3,000 separate portals of ocean science globally. So there's an effort now that's trying to interconnect all of these systems. So you have a system of systems, and that will greatly enhance and improve anybody's ability to be able to go find data and access it and connect it to something else, right? So I think that's gonna have tremendous power in terms of supporting the blue economy um, and then the, the new blue economy in terms of that data, information and knowledge. 
if you're referring to the work of the corporate data group, I would say these are early days. We've we formed in February. Um, we had our first in-person meeting in Paris last week, but I see tremendous p potential here. I mean, we have leading multinational corporations that are in the room. The, the challenge is not to convince them to share, share data and make it publicly accessible. The challenge is how do you actually get permissions, often from national governments, <laughs> uh, to make those data available? Because most of the activity and most of the data is actually from within national waters, and those operators have been given permission by the national government to conduct those activities. And it's not a given that those data can be freely uh, and made publicly accessible, right? So I can say that everyone in that room is actually on board in terms of sharing certain types of data at certain types of resolution. And we're working, and that, that of course, all of that comes from the, the blue economy. I mean, this work is happening every day. There is data being collected every day uh, in support of the blue economy. That data can become publicly accessible but there's some challenges and obstacles. <laughs> uh, one of the most significant ones is national permission. I think Thank you. Towards that, um, um, there's also a question of provenance of the data, um, attribution of the data. As the data is ingested into a large system, um, a lot of it is funded by national agencies, funding agencies, groups collect it, put it online, put it out there. And in order for those groups to continue being successful and providing the data, they, um, their agency, I'm thinking of say um, NOAA, NSF funded uh, data collection, fish, fisheries and so forth, um, needs to be um, a way to track how it's used and how much it's used um, in order to provide um, you know, foundation for continuing the programs. Um, they don't continue without showing success, successful outcomes. So how is that done in very large data management? Just curious. I, th I think it's done by still maintaining those separate systems, right? So you could, you don't necessarily have to move the data into a larger ecosystem or, or portal and lose some of the things you were doing before. It's about connecting that individual portal or system to others so that they can inter interconnect. So the architecture will allow that providence to be to be maintained um, and metadata to be maintained. Uh, uh, there are some guidelines around how how all of this should be structured so that this this broad, uh, much more broad uh, system of systems will will ultimately evolve. I don't know if that answers the question, but it's it's not like it's all being thrown out and put into a new super system. It's actually all of the architecture that will allow all the bits and pieces to be, be more effectively um, productive, right? Okay, well, thank you. I think um, it's time for us to move on. And um, we have two more presentations. Um, this time we're gonna be talking about the Decade Coordination Centers and there are two in North America. And so um, one is Ocean Visions, Ocean Climate Solutions, and then the other one is the Northeast Pacific Ocean Decade Collaborative Center. So um, Leonardo, are you online and ready to go? Uh, I am online, yes. Um, should I share the presentation or? Yes. Okay. If, if, if you're able to. Yes, let me attempt that. Can you see that? Yes, we can see it. Okay, it looks perfect. good. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, well, thank you for the opportunity to provide uh, this update. And uh, so I am feeling in today for our director, Courtney Magici. Uh, she's uh, on leave at the moment. So I'm, I'm Claire Valenzuela Perez, and I'm the director of the Global Ecosystem for Ocean Solutions, which is another UN initiative, but in this case, uh, UN program. 
and I will give you some of uh, the and information of the uh, uh, developments of uh, of the program during the last year and uh, some uh, of the um, work that we are expecting to do for the years to come. So let me see if I can. Okay. Okay. Yes. So first of all, this uh, um, UN Ocean Visions UN uh, Decade Collaborative Center. Uh, it's dedicated to uh, climate heating solutions specifically. Um, that is uh, our uh, main main characteristic, I would say. And uh, this is part of a collaboration with uh, Georgia Aquarium and Georgia Tech. And uh, the main uh, goal that we have is uh, to lead uh, the, the process to support the co-design, development, testing, and delivering of uh, scalable and equitable ocean-based solutions to mitigate and reverse the uh, effects of climate change. That, that is what makes uh, our program uh, the most unique, and uh, in particular, this emphasis on uh, mitigation and innovation. And the center works uh, the center's work contributes to the uh, UN Ocean Decade uh, through its strength, ext extending and strengthening uh, a focus on ocean-based climate solutions and innovations, I was mentioning. And the partnership pursues, among other things, supporting ocean climate innovations and solutions, focus ocean climate solutions, research collaborations, education, outreach, and capacity building. This includes social literacy, and advancing international collaboration and policy frameworks for development and deployment of ocean climate solutions. So there are uh, three strategic initiatives that the center has been pursuing. Uh, one of them is the ocean climate uh, innovation solution, ocean climate solutions innovation exchange. And this is mostly events, events dedicated to bring together um, different initiatives, different innovators are working on the cutting edge of, uh, of ocean climate uh, nexus and to allow for space for, for sharing and, uh, and also to, to gather with uh, other initiatives that are relevant for, for their work. We are also hosting uh, a community practice through uh, this ocean climate solutions community. Um, this is under, under development, but it's part of uh, the established initiatives of uh, IOC UNESCO. And the other aspect of this is uh, the hosting of programs under UN Ocean Decade. So we uh, are working our collaborations through this, uh, this network. And as we have also at Ocean Visions uh, a program, we are connecting um, this, this global network and global in, in in specifically we have a global network of hubs to develop capacity regionally um, specifically in areas that have high potential but uh, where opportunities uh, for access to funding and access to um, and support has not been uh, particularly great over time and also to also grow the understanding and concept of what could be done through ocean solutions to mitigate climate change. Um, then in terms of activities of 2023, this is more full slide. Uh, in terms of innovation exchange, um, there was uh, our participation as a one, one uh, relevant agent for the Ocean Vision Summit at Georgia Aquarium that was uh, probably one of the largest meetings of the year for ocean solutions, and in particular for ocean climate solutions uh, in April. Um, so we organized an innovation showcase and we had specifically UN Ocean Decade sessions. Um, we uh, have facilitated a, a blue carbon workshop with uh, international stakeholders to produce a blue carbon uh, roadmap that uh, will be out, we hope, in November, uh, and it's one of, uh, of our, our contributions for this year. And we also launched uh, a webinar series, and we are hosting more than 200 registrants per month in, in this initiative. Also specifically bringing uh, innovators to present their process and present uh, 
um, their experiences to um, an audience that so far has been quite international. They, in the case of the Ocean Climate Solutions Community, um, so we launched the Ocean Climate Solutions Committee of Practice via the uh, decade, um, if I remember well, it's called the UN Decade Forum. Um, also uh, hosting US ECOP node coordinators, uh, the, the node coordinators, sorry, through uh, ECOP North America via NOAA. And we have been hosting interns from University of uh, Georgia and from Hampton. And engagement in policy, we have been participating in, in, in some very relevant forums, uh, including um, the conference the Effects of Climate Change in the World Oceans in uh, Norway earlier this year, State of the Coast, uh, Chao in Washington, DC, also uh, the Ocean Justice Roundtable, uh, the White House, and uh, yeah, the Ocean Dialogues on the White House, so, sorry, State Department. And uh, UN Ocean Decade Support, we're hosting six uh, programs, uh, global focus for this. And uh, we are also members of the UN Ocean Decade Climate Working Group, so for climate challenges. And these are some uh, clips from media appearances of uh, the center. So this this. Will be will be available of course for you to to check if you, if you are interested uh, the center has uh, got a lot of attention uh, in the state of georgia because of uh, the type of ambition that is bringing and the fact that uh it's not often that it, like georgia aquarium will be associated with this type of, uh, of work and our center is hosted by georgia aquarium so the offices are in in atlanta um so in terms of upcoming upcoming events um uh, we have the uh deep ocean collective solutions accelerator um the un ocean conference uh decade un ocean decade conference uh, in april next year we are uh preparing some some events with our international partners the innovation exchange will continue as a cycle monthly and there are some uh science communication initiatives and at the facilities of uh of georgia aquarium um, and in terms of uh, who are the programs right now aligned with the center uh, as i mentioned one, another one led by ocean visions which is the global ecosystem for ocean solutions we have house and ocean startups which is a coalition of uh new um, business innovations in the ocean sector. Uh, we have the Global Ocean Oxygen Decade from IOC UNESCO, SmartNet, which is the sustainability of marine ecosystems through global knowledge networks, the Blue Climate Initiative, and Fish Core 2030. And so that's all I wanted to present to you today, and I'm available for your questions. And in case that I cannot answer your questions as I'm filling into this, uh position right now uh, i can also take them and answer later if uh, that's required okay thank you very much leonardo um does anyone have a quick question at this time okay um so let's go go ahead and, and get the second presentation from the other decade coordination center and this one uh, it's rebecca martone from the Northeast Pacific Ocean Decade. Hi there. Just getting my screen. Hi. Hi, can you hear me okay? I can hear you just fine. Yeah, and your screen is coming up. Terrific. Sorry. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much for the invitation to speak with you all again today um, about the progress we've been making under the Ocean Decade. I'm the Executive Director for the Ocean Decade Collaborative Center for the Northeast Pacific. And I'm joining you from my home on the territory of the Quetzal and Malahat First Nations of the Northeast Pacific, also known as the Cowichan Valley on Vancouver Island in British Columbia in Canada. I also just want to acknowledge the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of all the indigenous peoples that have called the Northeast Pacific region home since time immemorial. And note that we focus very much on indigenous and rights holder engagement in our region. So it's very important for us to um, point to the folks in the region that we work closely with. 
So um, for those of you that don't know us, we're one of the few Decade Collaborative Centers that was first to be endorsed um, as of June 2022. We're a contribution to the Ocean Decade from the Tula Foundation, which is a BC-based private foundation that also hosts the Hakai Institute with the Ocean uh, Observing Network and also supports the Hakai Magazine, which does a lot of um, communications about environmental issues around the oceans around the world. So as a regional collaborative center, different from the one that uh, Leonardo just presented, which is more thematic, our aim is to make the Ocean Decade a success in our region to support, facilitate, to support and facilitate co-designed and co-produced knowledge for collaborative solutions to the ocean challenges in our region. And our region includes the coastal and open oceans off the US and Canadian West Coast from Alaska to California and everything in between with extensions down into Baja California and Hawaii. And our center actually aims to tackle all of the challenges and outcomes that were identified in the Ocean Decade Implementation Plan. So from climate change to food security to the blue economy. So a large scope. Um, and in this case, we don't really have those you know, specific programs that we work with. Technically, we're open to working with programs and projects and groups that are interested in working in our region. So our role in the Ocean Decade are multi, multi-factorial. <laughs> They're really about cu cultivating connections and exchanges across communities, knowledge systems and boundaries um, to identify ocean knowledge gaps and opportunities to catalyze action that are centered on community needs, share the stories of the Ocean Decade, specifically Ocean Decade actions, really raising awareness and highlighting diverse work and opportunities in our region and to mobilize knowledge and resources to accelerate transformative solutions. So over the past year and a half, we've grown from a group of three full-time staff to nine staff total, which full, some are full-time, some are part-time. Our combined time is about five FTE. Um, oh, let me go back. We are a group of all women, it turns out, um, with a diverse set of skills, including communication specialists, facilitators, project managers, scientists with a range of backgrounds, anything from oceanography to ecology, um, to archeology span and anthropology. And as I mentioned, we're part of the Tula Foundation and so are also supported by the Tula Foundation's administrative staff and other scientists and specialists across our organization. We also have a broad group of advisors from across the region, including folks in Alaska, Washington, Oregon, California, as well as British Columbia ranging from government to NGOs, academia, research science institutions, and indigenous communities, uh, again, with a broad range of skills and backgrounds. So what do we actually do? I think I've spoken to many of you before, but in case you know, you're not familiar with our work, um, we do a lot of what has been talked about here, hosting dialogues and conference sessions and workshops centered on our regional issues and priorities. We really work to synthesize and mobilize knowledge and identify gaps and opportunities to fill those gaps, at least in this early part of the Ocean Decade. We also work to communicate and amplify Ocean Decade actions in our region and generally um, various work uh, of groups around the region, as well as to support global and regional awareness of the challenges and solutions that are taking place in our region. We work very carefully to support and amplify early career ocean professionals and indigenous voices and underserved communities in our decade and the ocean decade. This is something that we're continuing to build and work on and something that we'll continue to do over time. Um, but we find it's very important to engage rights holders and stakeholders in our region, uh, particularly those that are typically, uh, again, underserved. We work on developing networking tools and forums so that we can be a regional hub for information and opportunity. So we do that in a number of ways I'll talk about shortly. And again, we build relationships and opportunities for decade actions to work with each other, but also with other uh, Ocean Decade organizations through the DCCs, DCOs, uh, the Canadian Ocean Decade champions, as well as a number of stakeholders and rights holders. We've had a really busy first year. So collectively as a group, we've participated in or hosted over 253 meetings and events, reaching close to 10,000 people. So we have a broad network, which is very exciting. Um, our work has been primarily focused in the Northeast Pacific with strong participation from Canada and the US, but our reach does extend to other parts of the world. Uh, and we do try to 
um, collect this information as we go, um, things around gender and participation from various types of stakeholders. This is something we're continuing to work on and are really interested in thinking about how to do this better. One way that we've extended our reach is through our new Ocean Decade Dialogue Series, which intends to convene conversations among ocean scientists, practitioners, and community members in the region, really highlighting timely topics and new advances in ocean science through the lens of the decade, and really grounded in the interests and priorities of, of the communities that we work with. Um, we do this for about an hour, usually typically hosting a conversation and then also a 30 minute session with early career professionals that are acting as hosts and supporting direct conversations between the speakers of the dialogue and the ECOPS, which really enhances direct experience and hands-on experience and facilitation um, and extending networks for the ECOPS in our region. Over the past year, we've hosted five dialogues that you can see here that pull together various experts and stakeholders uh, around various topics that highlight different actions in our region where possible. So for example, we highlight, excuse me, we hosted a dialogue on using environmental DNA for monitoring and stewardship in the Northeast Pacific in collaboration with the Ocean Biomolecular Observing Network program that's led by Margaret Leinen from Scripps, um, as well as with groups from other parts of the region that are projects endorsed. So for example, um, the Hakai Institute highlighted work of their project that's endorsed under the Ocean Decade called the High Bond Project, which includes monitoring and partnership with the Mamalila Kula First Nation in their newly established um, indigenous uh, protected and conserved area. And Zach Gold showcased the eDNA work that he leads at NOAA's Pacific Marine Environmental Laboratory. So really trying to get a broad perspective of different groups across the region. We have other dialogues that are um, queued up. So we have one on kelp mapping guidance that was an endorsed decade action, um, an activity in our region. We're hosting one in English and one in Spanish um, that's extending our reach to the global south. And then also one with NOAA's MPAs as Sentinels program with a focus on the National Marine Sanctuaries that will be in partnership with Selena, who's there here in the room, uh, and Madison Miller from NOAA. So uh, examples of ways that we can partner with different um, actions in our region. We're also working to move beyond dialogues to actively uh, collaborate on larger, longer type of formats or workshops that really allow for deeper discussion. So the aim of these workshops is to bring together and amplify the voices of rights holders and stakeholders to really dig into those topics and illuminate knowledge gaps, barriers, and opportunities for collaboration. So over the next nine months, we're gonna be co-hosting four to five workshops in a variety of topics. So for example, at the Pisces meeting, which will be taking place in Seattle in October, maybe some of you will be there. We'll be hosting with the Alaska Fisheries Science Center from NOAA, a workshop on indigenous and community led approaches to support climate change adaptation and ecosystem resilience in the North Pacific and Arctic. Um, we'll also be attending that um, meeting. So if you're there, please take a look and find some of our staff. I'll be there. Um, a series of workshops we're also be hosting on cultural heritage and climate change beginning in December of 2023, focused on the impacts of climate change on tangible and intangible cultural heritage in the Northeast Pacific. And we have a steering committee that is made up of a number of experts and indigenous scholars uh, in our region. Uh, we'll be doing a deeper dive on eDNA use and management in March of 2024 with the OBON related projects. And we've heard as part of that and also beyond that conversation, we need to start addressing the issue of data sovereignty um, and implementation of the care principles. So it's glad to hear see that come up in the chat today because that's something we'll be continuing to work on and happy to chat more about um, how we, we plan to do that in our region. We're also going to be hopefully hosting a, a side event in Barcelona on co-designing and co-producing knowledge with communities in partnership with some of the partners from the foundations dialogue. We also participate in that with our Tula Foundation hat on. Um, and we'll be we are currently participating in the Ocean Decade Vision 2030 process on working groups one, two, and 10. So looking forward to hopefully seeing some of you there. Um, as I mentioned, a big part of what we do is communicating the work of our center and the decade actions in our region. Um, and just to note, we have a number of ways that we try to raise awareness and amplify this work. Um, we've established strong presence over a number of external channels. We have a website that has over 6,000 unique visitors, a newsletter with over a thousand subscribers, 
Um, our social media channels are, are continuing to build. Um, we typically use the platform formerly known as Twitter, um, as well as uh, LinkedIn and, and Facebook, and building out again that opportunity for others to know about the Ocean Decade. Um, we also have a community of practice on the Ocean Decade Network, which, which we're testing to see if that's a useful way of people connecting. And finally, we're beginning to start a new campaign called People of the Ocean Decade, which aims to tell the story of teams dedicated, um, dedicated to um, making the Ocean Decade a success, so various passionate ocean, ocean professionals, um, and really using this as a doorway for folks to get to know about the Ocean Decade, as well as uh, projects in the region. So we've developed uh, some deeper, longer um, pieces that are in our news section on our, our website. And then we're also putting together a reel to share at meetings and conferences that will have QR codes that have direct access. So again, ways that people can find out more about the Ocean Decade. Um, and I think it appeals if you can see beautiful humans like Sharice here, who's the head of the Deep Sea Ecology Program with DFO and led um, Seamount mapping expedition with the Haida Nation and New Channel Tribal Council. So happy to talk more with all of you if there's ways that we can use this to support actions in the region. And um, finally, just everything that we do is really meant to support and catalyze endorse activities in the region. To date, we've catalyzed seven Ocean Decade activities and four projects. And we have five or six projects that are in the queue. Um, and maybe just to go back to what Heather Spence and Liz mentioned, you know, we are always trying to um, tout the benefits of participating in the Ocean Decade. And this is something we can start to provide some insight into in terms of what we're hearing, um, but also something we could use support with. So if there's opportunity for the National Decade Committee to lead in that space, we'd be very welcome. Um, one thing I wanted to mention, you know, funding is obviously something people have mentioned quite a lot. It's something we're also working to catalyze through the foundations dialogue. But one example is um, some funding we recently helped to catalyze through the province of British Columbia. We received $1.7 million that we're hosting um, in support of new projects that tackle the objectives and actions laid out in the um, British Columbia Ocean Acidification and Hypoxia Action Plan, which is endorsed under the Ocean Acidification Research for Sustainability Program. And just to note that one of the reasons that money um, actually was targeted towards that action plan is because it was endorsed under the UN decade. So something to note, it can actually help um, to be endorsed to actually get funding within government. So I know that was a lot very quickly, um, but I'm happy to, if anybody wants to reach out to me at any time, you can contact me through our Ocean Decade email or directly and I encourage you to uh, keep an eye on the various events and things that we're hosting over the coming uh, months and, and come find us at the various conferences. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Rebecca. And uh, I'd like to open it up to any questions or comments now. Oh, it's a quiet afternoon. Um, yeah, so I guess, I, you know, I'm really interested to hear what you said about having an endorsed program that now has some funding. And so I, I guess I was kind of curious, is that, um, do you think it, it was something that in their proposal, they mentioned that they had the endorsement of the Ocean Decade, and that was one of the um, selling points for funding the proposal? Or was it an actual call for endorsed programs? No, it was actually money that was um, mobilized because one of the co-partners of that action plan is the province of British Columbia, but the the lead of that program actually went to internal government partners and said, look, we need money to get this off the ground. Is there any money available? And by the way, this is a UN endorsed action and is something that people are seeing and could really highlight you know, the, the provincial government's leadership. And so he was able to get that, that money to kickstart this and it's actually created a lot of buzz in government. So really in, in this case, it's a provincial government, um, which is obviously akin to state government, but because it was endorsed, it got attention. And so that's where that, how that funding came through. And then we are the recipients of the funds because they needed an external partner to actually help implement this um, so that the province would be a bit of an arm's length. And, um, and so that's our role in supporting the project in this case. Uh, so, yeah, that's great. It, it really helps to hear some of those details to really understand, you know, maybe where there's some opportunities. 
certainly in Canada, maybe there's something in the US as well. Yeah. So anyone else? And, you know, I can open it up, you know, more broadly as well for comments or questions at this stage. Okay, I think people may need more coffee or at least to stand up and walk around and get the blood moving. So why don't we take a 10 minute break and or a 12 minute break, we can reconvene at 3.30. And that's when we're going to hear from um, the Inner Academy Partnership and also the Youth Advisory Council. And we'll be talking in particular about um, planning for the Barcelona conference. So see you at 3.30 um, Eastern. Ah, yeah, so <laughs> snacks and coffee, <laughs> very important. And it's right across the hall from us. I know that So we just need to be reminded of this kind of thing, right? Yeah.
So uh, so our, our little break seems to have gotten a little bit longer. So I apologize to those of you who are online, <laughs> but we are reconvening now. And um, this will be our last um, set of speakers for the day. And it's really focusing on the 2024 UN Ocean Decade Conference, which will be in Barcelona in April. And this is really thinking about what are some potential opportunities for the US National Committee to participate in, in the conference. And again, you know, right now we're thinking about what can we do that'll make a difference. So that's that's kind of the theme of the day. And so um, yeah, <laughs> more coffee. <laughs> Yes, well, that was the break, you know, it was for more coffee. <laughs> and hopefully, and I'm sure in Barcelona, they'll have coffee too. So yeah. Um, so the first um, speaker today is going to be Rania Acosti, and she's at the um, National Academy of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine. She was a colleague um, in the Division on Earth and Life Studies until she went international. And so now she, she wears two hats. And um, but one of them is working with the Inter Academy um, partnership. And that's really the one that we've been interested in since we're a US national committee affiliated with the National Academy of Sciences, seeing if that's a model that might be adopted by other countries that are interested in having national committees. So Rania. Thank you very much, Sue, and thank you very much for the invitation to uh, have a discussion with you today. I don't see myself as a speaker, but I hope that this is a discussion. 
Uh, as Sue said, I direct uh, a program within the policy and global affairs of the U.S. National Academies. Uh, I direct the Inter-Academy Partnership, and I also direct a second program also within International Eye, uh, uh, or a board, I should say, the Board on International Scientific Organizations which is the host of 18 US national committees for ranging from chemistry, biology, astronomy, and others. And uh, my board is also serves as the US national committee to the International Science Council. Uh, so a lot of international work, which is relatively new to me. For many years, I was doing, uh, 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 I was running studies on radiation health issues in the division that Sue is uh, part of. So today I will talk about IAP to give you an idea of what we do, uh, perhaps what the capabilities are to um, work collaboratively. And uh, I could uh, kind of overhear the discussion in that side of uh, the table about the challenge of international work, starting with who pays for what. I don't think we lack good ideas, but then the implementation is not always easy. So IAP or Inter-Academy Partnership is a network of 150 academies of science, medicine and engineering globally. In uh, the US, as you know, what we call NASAM, the National Academy of uh, Sciences, Engineering and Medicine has three honorary organizations. Two of them, the science and medicine are also part of IAP, but engineering is not. Uh, but we do value the interdisciplinary uh, uh, work because we understand that all global problems require interdisciplinary work. So we try to work with uh, academies of science, medicine and engineering. The NAS, so not NASCM, but NAS is hosting the uh, Secretariat for IAP. And there is a second secretariat in uh, Trieste, which operationally is part of the UNESCO system. So we have some relationship with UNESCO through them. We don't have specific areas where we focus on. We often react to what our uh, members think it's an important problem, either regionally or globally. Uh, but some of the highlights of our work the la last five or six years is on climate health on uh, food security, but we also do quite a bit of work on uh, uh, research uh, integrity. And we had a, a recent report on uh, predatory journals that was uh, kind of a highlight of the past couple of years at least. So talking to Sue, because we are uh, colleagues uh, for a decade or more, um, uh, she was the one who approached me in my new role as IAP to have a uh, just a brainstorming discussion whether IAP could assist countries to create a national uh, decade committee uh, uh, similar to what is happening uh, within the United States. And to the best of my knowledge, and Sue, correct me if I'm wrong, the National Academies is the only academy who is hosting a national committee. All the others are either belong to a government agency or some kind of entity that is uh, quasi-governmental. So Sue and I started discussions internally, then we talked to uh, a UNESCO representative who I understand is the uh, leads for UNESCO Decade Coordination Unit. Uh, we had a very positive uh, response from him. Um, and as a, perhaps a focus area, uh, he thought and we agreed that perhaps uh, col working with the African region uh, could lead to something fruitful. The idea is that uh, they would benefit from understanding what the model is within the US uh, National Academies. Um, and uh, perhaps we can help them with transfer of lessons learned. So after the meeting with the UNESCO representative at headquarters, we talked to the regional representative who was also on board and then connected us with the task force for um, the national uh, decade. Uh, we had a, 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 a sincere discussion about the challenges that, again, my understanding is that even uh, within the US, the committee is still trying to figure out what exactly the contributions can be and be as effective as possible. So we're very aware of not pretending that uh, we can help another region when uh, we know that there are issues. And it's not only helping them set up a committee, but also help them maintain a committee or um, 
have the uh, appropriate the base there to make the committee functional. So what I'm hoping I would get from uh, discussing with you today is your thoughts about this, uh, whether it's something you're interested and uh, it's supported, um, and any ideas you have on how we can be uh, an effective partner in that effort. And again, with any, uh, maybe as a closing remark, with any of my international work, the idea is not to force a model, the US model, because we do things right. Although uh, I think the scientific community within the United States has is extremely strong, but also uh, adjust the thinking for the uh, regional circumstances. There are very different uh, continents, very different regions with very different resources and a way of thinking. So I'm, uh, I welcome any comments you have about this idea altogether. Well, thank you, Rania. Um, yeah, just one thing I'll mention. I mean, there were, well, there are a couple. One was, you know, the initial questions came up about how do you support uh, a national committee? Where does the support come from? And certainly in some of those countries, that's going to be, you know, probably a more difficult issue than it was for the U.S. Um, and then the other one was that they they brought up was um, having help in in terms of getting um, their their activities endorsed. So they felt that they could really use some assistance there. And I see maybe some real opportunities there if we can identify um, you know, some of the programs that they would like to see get endorsed and identify potential partners in our community who could perhaps help them do that. So that was, um, those are a couple of other things. Um, let's see, Tom. Thank you for your comments. Um... I often say in this committee that I worry that we forget the last three words in the title of, of the program, right? It's the UN Decade for Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. And we've spent a lot of time on the ocean science side of things. And I think there are broad advantages to thinking about capacity development in general in ocean science, one element of which could be the role a national committee could play but but i do think that's a that would be a rich heritage from a an un ocean decade if we help develop scientific capacity Yeah, so, <laughs> so I'll throw this back at you, Tom. Do you have anything specific in mind, uh, some way that um, the U.S. National Committee might be able to contribute to that? I thought you were going to ask me if there were places I would like like to go, but all right, uh, I'll, I'll ask that next. <laughs> <laughs> no, i I think I think there are really important ways to think about how sort of academic university based science interacts with government science and policy interacts with with private science in ways that that the us has had to face in in many ways in ways in which developing nations haven't so david you mentioned in your presentation the idea of one of the challenges is nations quite legitimately have rights to the data in their areas. And in many cases, they haven't thought about that. In many cases, yeah, in many cases, other companies have come in and, and assumed those rights and kept them for themselves as, as oil development as a, as a good example. And so I think anything the US can do to, can, to help further a dialogue among that triumvirate of of, of civil society, well, more than tr more than three, but civil society, academic science, government science, and oversight and and private in, in, in industry, I think would be really helpful. Marcia. So I'm wondering if there is a, a role here um, for the decade to um, 
engage with philanthropic agencies to kind of show them opportunities that might be available um, with developing countries. Like I know that there's a really exciting program that I think Scripps has in Nigeria that we've heard about before. Um, so is there a way to highlight that to um, perhaps interested universities and philanthropic partners? Okay. Uh, I'm, my information stated, but the decade has attempted the IOC in Paris and their staff has attempted to collect philanthropies to try and get them targeted on opportunities within the decade for for the programs and, and projects. I think the challenge that those philanthropies have is is reading through the phone book of 200 projects nested under 30 plus or 40 programs and, and really understanding how do these nest. And you can ask yourself the rhetorical question, how many ocean observations of whatever indicator have we already seen and heard in reviewing the decade material? It's really hard to get a handle on that, which is an impediment. It's not the burden of the United States National Committee to organize that. I think that's the IOC's burden to organize that better so they could sell better. I think they know that, but they haven't so far realized the resources in order to put enough staff in to get that done. So I think that's what's holding up some of the philanthropy. And, and then also the, the real key is figuring out which philanthropy has an interest in what subject, because that's also more on family foundations. There's a there's a, a personally held virtue and value that some might help. But if we can if we can show where it has been successful in a couple of ways, and I think we had a presentation here with Ocean Visions and others to to be looking at, well, this has worked and that's worked, et cetera. So so lead by the successful examples. I think that's an excellent suggestion. Thank you. Uh, Charlotte, I think I see your hand up. Would you like to go next? Thank you. Yes. I mean, I think just to continue along that philanthropy, you know, to jump on the philanthropy bandwagon, um, and I see Mark has his hand up right behind me. We're both members of that philanthropy group, the Foundations Dialogue, which frankly, uh, well, we're both members of that group. I will say, um, in reference, though, to the National Committee and um, the, I think, conversations um, that are that are present right now, I think that leading by example, there are opportunities where other governments have stepped up in areas where they feel expertise, particularly around capacity development is needed. And in particular, there is what's called a capacity, I think it's called the capacity development facility. Now that throws everybody off because it's not actually a facility right now. It's a person um, who sits at IOC, who is going to be instrumental in trying to bring um, more attention to the capacity development within the decade across all programs. And so that pro that facility is being stood up right now by the government of Flanders, Belgium, but um, you know, we'll need, we'll need additional support. I see it as a way that the US, even without dollars, the national committee could contribute in kind um, to that as, as they're still putting their ideas together about what that, what that, facility does, I see an, an, a great in-kind contribution here, if that's all the U.S. can muster at this point, which meaning the U.S. government. Um, so I think that's, you know, I think that's definitely a place I would look. The woman who, I had the privilege of um, sitting through a three-hour U.N. Decade Advisory Board meeting this morning, so this has been a U.N. <laughs> UN day for me, but I did meet um, the woman who's just been hired to run that capacity development facility, and her name is Mary Frances Davidson, and I know she's eager to talk to anybody who has ideas, so I'll put that out there. Um, and I will just say on the second piece, which is the philanthropy, matching philanthropy with the decades, I think you are correct that no philanthropic institution I have found yet has sorted through the web pages. Um, I don't even sort through all the web pages and I'm supposed to know what all the programs are to be able to figure out where matchmaking can happen. And so there at the last foundations dialogue meeting, which um, was this summer, a small group formed um, from that group to try to create a, what they're calling a matchmaking tool. I hate tools, but this is what they came up with where they're trying to frankly figure out some algorithms where you can sort through all the programs, projects and activities on the UN decade website and match those up, you know, and, and look for things you're you're interested in supporting. So it's supposed to be for philanthropy, 
our philanthropy is leading the small groups, leading the charge to try to build this tool. But to be honest, it would be applicable to anybody looking for programs that they were interested in, whether it's universities or researchers who want to join and, and you know, look for what projects are, fun, are supported. So I think there, there could be broader application of this tool, but it is it also needs funding to support the tool. So we're a little bit in a, you know, where's the money and, and we, how are we going to support all of this? But but those conversations are happening. I just wanted to share. Yes, uh, go ahead, Nicole. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, Charlotte, thank you for those comments. Those uh, sort of spurred a couple of things that I wanted to make some points for. One of the hopeful uh, outcomes of the new budgeting process that we um, agreed to at the IOC and have not yet implemented, we will be doing that um, in the coming months, um, is that we are gonna be working with the IOC Secretariat to develop more standardized uh, ways for the regional bodies to provide their requirements um, so that we can better understand those in a transparent way so that not only we can set our priorities for those additional funds internal to the IOC, but we were also very clear in our discussions that the uh, ability for those requirements to be written down and understandable is an opportunity if when we know we're not gonna be able to fund them all, but it is a way to begin to convey to others what we see as the observing requirements in the different regional bodies and that kind of thing. So that's so that's one thing. It was sort of a, we know we're not gonna be able to fund all these things, but let's get it down in a way that can be conveyed to others. Um, the second um, idea, and I've been sort of chatting with Liz about this, we, we might want to consider uh, for New York Climate Week next year is having some kind of a, uh, a presence and maybe there was one I only attended a few events um, but the ones that I attended were all uh, associated with very large um, investment and financial firms looking to provide very large amounts of money and they were very interested in ocean and coastal issues and I sort of stumbled not stumbled but it wasn't a, a very uh, strategic or coordinated engagement across maybe IOC or UN Decade or some other things that we might think about doing next year because they, there was a lot of interest there. And then just similar, and maybe it's a matchmaking uh, tool or event, um, but we're thinking a lot about that when we are able to elucidate these demand signals um, and not have the funding to back that up. And I am talking with the other federal agencies uh, right now about all of the great IRA and BIO money we got to do all kinds of things associated with climate resilience. And every single one of us across the board is having a demand signal come in that's 10, 20, 30 or more times the amount of money that we have. That's data right there. And um, I've already talked with my own personal team back at the National Ocean Service about how we use that data. But we're also sitting down with the other federal agencies and saying, okay, so what do we do with that information? Um, because I think right now the word on the street is we're all flush with cash and the problem's gonna go away in a few years because we'll have it all solved. When you have 20, 30 or more time demand signal for habitat restoration, coastal resilience, resilient ports, whatever your flight, whatever your thing is, it's another kind of um, piece of information that gives you pause about how you're gonna poise yourself for the future. But anyway, lots of matchmaking ideas. Yeah, I guess the only thing I'll add is that um, actually with uh, this, I think it was Liz's suggestion, we did put in a searchable database on our website for the um, endorsed actions that are have U.S. involvement. So at least for matchmaking, you know, with those projects, you know, there is there is that resource available. Uh, Mark, I see you have your hand up. Yep, thank you very much. Um, just one one comment on on Climate Week. We did host a very large uh, event for the decade um, uh, using the vessel Atlantis um, to to host a reception and and try and again drum up more attention and uh, uh, announce the uh, foundations dialogue statement from Monaco, the most recent uh, dialogue meeting. Uh, and then, of course, I was involved in many of the um, investment meetings during Climate Week as well that were focused on on oceans. But I don't think um, there's an intersection between the investment houses 
uh, the banks, the multilateral banks, um, and the decade. And I think there's a, a fault of outreach um, or outreach ability by the IOC to do so. Uh, that could be a role that we as a national committee could do a better job of is reaching uh, out to the private sector, to the banking and lending sector, finance sector, um, uh, et cetera. But I, I raised my hand back when, when Craig was talking and I'm going to, to you know, kindly uh, push back a little bit on, on the idea that, you know, the funders just can't find the stuff to write a check for. Um, I don't, I don't think that that's true. Um, I think, you know, we advised uh, Vladimir and the IOC from day one that they needed to get the uh, funders of all kinds um, involved early in the decade and have buy-in. Um, and none of that advice was ever followed. Um, and so there was a, a real sort of disconnect in which uh, the IOC consulted the audiences that they're used to consulting, um, scientists and um, governments, uh, and the governments usually being their funders, um, but did not really consult um, much more broadly than that. And I think that therefore no one sees this as something they have ownership of or uh, a role in. Um, and so they don't see their ideas uh, re reflected. Um, and, and so I think uh, we're, we're barely scratching the surface with the foundation's dialogue and laying out a set of concepts around co-design and you know figuring out if philanthropists can pick that as something they're willing and capable of supporting and i believe we're beginning to you know see some traction on that out of the boak nadel statement from the um, second foundations dialogue meeting um but i don't think it's you know not not being able to find stuff right I, I, you know th these are sophisticated uh organizations and you know they they have the capacity to to figure this out the the problem really is you know the time cycles for foundations to make decisions can sometimes be a minimum of 24 months and we're we're only three years into the decade um you know and we've we took us you know a while to reach them and it's going to take a while for this to even get folded in assuming they decide there's alignment with their their missions and and their goals, um, but you know they you know when we first started talking to them about the the decade they're like well we're fully subscribed we have no extra money, um, and so we're sitting here with this thing with you know no U.S. government leadership no U.S. money, um, no philanthropic money and so uh, and and I will credit give great credit to the the you know couple of foundation uh i'm sorry decade centers and, and that have been funded as something that is is out in front but uh, a lot more is obviously needed um and i think we need to really um keep talking about you know what this all looks like um and and uh, get the philanthropists to see it as having value. Um, then, after that, finding the projects to support is a no-brainer. I don't. I'm not. I am not worried about that at all. Uh, David Miller. Yeah, I, I just wanted to follow up to um, Mark's comment and to Nicole's comment around the discussions in New York at Climate Week. I was there as well and, and was in many meetings that brought together private investment and uh, financing uh, community with government, with NGOs, right? And uh, um, I think it's a fair point and a fair comment that the ocean decade, there is a disconnect between that community and the ocean decade. The ocean decade is very science focused and what the investment community and finance community is looking for is data um, that will de-risk their investment. And that will come from uh, an improved regulatory framework or certainty in regulatory frameworks globally. And it will 
required data um, to support that that de-risking, right? So we're also very involved with the UN Ocean, sorry, the the UN Global Compact Ocean Stewardship Coalition, which is very focused on finance and investment. And even though those are two UN organizations, and this is a UN committee for the US, uh, I think it's, I just want to highlight, there's an incredibly important but still missing link between the work of the UN Global Compact and the UN Ocean Decade to help bridge that connection between finance investment um, and the science and the data. I'll just jump in very quickly and say, you know, we worked with the UN Global Compact in New York for an entire day's worth of conversations around financing the blue economy and had all of the major international banks, multilateral banks, uh, et cetera, in the room. And not once did the decade of ocean science, you know, enter the, the conversation. Um, even, you know, it was, let me state that a different way. It was raised, but it never became a subject of interest or conversation. Liz, thank you. <laughs> I didn't want to speak out of turn. Uh, Mark, um, but could it be said that that event in New York that happened last week came about because somewhat of the renewed focus and the science that underpins sustainable decision making in the world and call it the decade or call it the SDGs. I mean, like that, that, that meeting of the minds that you had, was it stimulated by this idea of, Hey, we got to rethink and refocus our energy in supporting science underpinning sustainable development. Like, I think the fact that decade wasn't mentioned, it should be less of a concern for us coming from the United States in particular and the differing politics around opinions about the UN uh, aside, right? But let's be clear, you know, it's not about the UN here. It's about countries that came together and decided that it's a good idea to refocus our energy about how ocean science underpins our decision making. And so I, I don't mean to be talking through the question I'm asking you, Mark, and I think I kind of want to hear your response. So I'm going to stop talking now, but you know, you yeah, know what so, I'm saying. Absolutely. And, and, you know, I think this, uh, Goes goes back to um, comment earlier about always remembering the SD uh, part of the the name of the decade. Um, you know, our uh, all of the conversations were about the sustainable development goals in general, um, and the the UN Global Compact has you know the whole effort around the oceans for uh, SDG fourteen and has various other conversations going around other efforts. Um, whether science is the the um foundation uh is is assumed perhaps uh, but i think the whole idea is you know how do we how do how do they as lenders and investors uh put money behind you know projects that constitute sustainable development and because they're profit-making corporations that will produce a return for them um and you know i think they've got some creative ideas in mind um and some of them will require scientific activities such as you know restoration and protection of blue carbon but you know again i would say they're not necessarily focusing on um you know the decade or the need for science to underpin their lending or investing. Does that make sense? Susan, do you mind if I jump in again real quick? This is <laughs> this, this is really helping me a lot. Mark, thank you for bringing. Um, I did not mean to forget. I do know that there were a lot of other activities going on at UN Decade, or sorry, that at, at New York Climate Week that I was not a part of. Um, but this kind of a debrief, I think, is really important because the the rooms that I was in having conversations were about the data, ocean data and coastal data availability, a little bit for sustainability, but also for climate adaptation. So it was a little bit of they those folks want to know how can I make sure the data will be available to me to de-risk 
my business to make money down the road, right? No, 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 nothing shy about that. But there is a good overlap. There is enough complementarity here, I think, that that we can, I don't know if it's hone our messaging or, um, uh, and it, it maybe doesn't have to be about the decade. Uh, but so, for example, I was at the launch of the um, Morgan Stanley uh, big uh, sustainability initiative. Um, and it was about sustainability, but it was also climate de-risking, right? And they were very interested in finding out where the data is going to come from. So um, maybe somewhat of a debrief, mm -hmm. even more than this, would be useful. Mark, I'd be happy to tag up with you and Charlotte after. Sounds great. Thank you. Um, Mark, I'm going to going to put the ping pong ball back up in the air, um, hit it where you want. But there are a lot of people in the investment community that are chasing marine carbon dioxide removal and money is being spent on it. And I don't know that 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 it's being spent in the right place because we don't know that marine carbon dioxide removal is a viable solution until science is performed. Yet we do have investments being made in those directions and, and people are ramping up for it. Now it raises a whole number of risk-based questions. What is the environmental impact, et cetera? So number one, there's science that needs to be done in order to figure out, will this work? But the other half of it is we won't know if it works until we have a more robust and more widely distributed three-dimensionally observing system in the ocean. So the, the, the notion of, um, not engaging so i'm following your statement mark that a lot of the potential investors aren't really asking for more science but if they're doing their due diligence i think they will realize what a speculative nature of planning to invest in marine carbon dioxide removal is at this point in time until more science is done yeah I, I i think you're absolutely right and you know we're working part of the our involvement in these conversations is to raise the question about you know doing adequate due diligence on any of these climate geoengineering projects including carbon dioxide removal and what is is necessary to understand about what uh the efficacy is and and whether long-term storage uh actually works or not um and you know sometimes that produces you know glazing over people's eyes uh, in the finance community. Um, but it, it, it is something that we are, are talking regularly to them all about. Um, I do think, you know, again, because they're focused on where they could make a return, they see that and the potential to create credits or something else as, you know, a, a fundable or, or lendable uh, activity where, uh, you know, planting seagrass is, is not uh, uh, as, as, as such. Um, and so, you know, part of this is, is educational. Um, and, you know, I think we can do a collectively do a good job uh, on improving that. Uh, but yeah, I think that's um, one of the things they're focusing on and uh, need to do a better job thinking through, you know, what is necessary for, you know, success and 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 proving it up um you know there's a, a a code of conduct for doing experiments with um ocean cdr uh coming out shortly um i believe in the next you know two weeks um i was just one of the reviewers on it um and so i'm i'm hopeful that we you know shout all of this stuff out loudly going forward and we don't waste a whole bunch of investments on chasing uh, unproven, uh, expensive technology, particularly on the mechanical and chemical ocean CDR side. I was just, I was just thinking about the the sustainable development piece and what you were saying about the IAP and thinking about where are there, like where's the low hanging fruit for uh, new initiatives or collaborations with kind of tangible, because also coming off this conversation with MCDR, like what, there's some things that are part 
you know, our topics are within the ocean realm of the ocean decade that are like, can have tangible local benefits. And I'm thinking about things like energy, national security, even, and I don't know how much national security or, you know, security type things are even part of the conversation, but that there's all, there's lots of, you know, coastal resilience, but also protections could kind of have that kind of angle. Um, and so I guess I'm just, you know, I guess I guess want to raise that as a, a question, you know, are those things, I mean, I know energy is part of it, like I'm putting on my other hat, but is the security angle one that's being part? Uh, how do you guys agree that this is one of the ways that we could foster um, more tangible initiatives, get bring in buy-in with, you know, for example, if you're looking at like applied science in Africa, it, it, anyway, it's not, it's a, it's a proto thought, but I thought I'd throw it out there. No, I, I think you're, you're spot on. I think there are conversations about coastal resilience, uh, 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 adaptation, uh, retreat from coast, uh, et cetera, items that can be fundable and, uh, and or avoided um, uh, by insurance companies, uh, uh, risks to be avoided by insurance companies. So there's a lot of conversation about that side of thing within the the funding side of things. I think the security piece is also very loud and clear. I think there's a, a concern about disruption from uh, climate refugees. I think there is concern about uh, anticipatory retaliation for weather modification uh, projects. Um, I think that if there are um, uh, some kinds of uh, CDR projects that involve uh, putting alkaline materials or other materials in the ocean, uh, there may be neighboring countries who object to those on pollution grounds um, and various other arguments that, that, that are, are being made. Um, that that are uh, you know, rising up. What's not happening, and and you you sort of you know, are are heading in the right direction with a proto question, is you know how do we talk about the role of the decade in getting the science together? Uh, I think it was Craig's voice earlier that shows us um, you know how much we need the observing in order to know whether any of these things work or don't work or even you know, quickly recognize if they're causing uh, unintended harm. Um, and so, you know, figuring out how to connect the dots and show the value of the kind of things that are suggested to to um, uh, move forward and have the basis for making any of these decisions, I think, is is a real opportunity. Okay, I, I know there are more hands. I'm going to say, hold your questions. Um, we're going to move on to um, April Peebler, who came, I think, all the way from California to join us today um, to talk about um, some of the plans that they're putting together for the Barcelona Conference in association with uh, the Youth Advisory Council. So, April, do you want to, you can come up here and... Sure. And, um, and I'm wondering... I'm going to... Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, and can Safa run on the from the slides? Is that possible? Yeah. All right. So I'm going to actually skip some of these slides, and I'll just say to to jump to future slides. Um, I think a lot of you here um, have heard the Youth Advisory Council, and from some of the youth, this is we're now entering the fourth cohort. So rather than share about the Youth Advisory Council and Airs for Oceans, I'm going to jump straight into to why I'm here. My name is April Peebler. I'm executive director of Airs for Oceans and the founding director. And uh, the, the U.S. Youth Advisory Council for the UN Ocean Decade is an initiative of Airs for Ocean, just so that you understand what that relationship is. Um, and if you could jump down, please, to slide five. 
Um, and what we could do, I hope, is if anyone wants more information on the advisory council and what we do, um, maybe you could share the slide deck with everyone. That would be super. So this is a fourth cohort. We had 64 applicants. Um, it's a it's a meaty, healthy, fantastic cohort. Um, we do recruit from also territories so that you have here um, a youth from Tinian Island and CNMI. We're very happy about that. Um, the slide six, please, next one. The commitment that, ah, Madison Miller, she was in the first cohort. I see her chat. <laughs> Yay, hi, Madison. <laughs> um, so our, our shared home, like this is kind of the vehicle in which we connect the youth. We connect them in purpose. So it's, it's connecting and not just the concept of ocean, but our one water system and really conveying the message that it's our shared home, this one water system or this blue planet. And so that shared component becomes a connectivity piece in moving forward in purpose. Um, if you can move down now to slide eight, just really briefly, these, sorry, one more above. Yeah, these are the working group committees. There's policy, movement, education, and communications team. Education in the last cohort um, created a fantastic toolkit. Um, it is over 80 pages. It addresses the 10 challenges of the UN Ocean Decade, and um, they include their youth perspective in each one of those um, on each one of those challenges. And that is in its final stages. It's a, a hefty one. It's in its final stages of being edited now. So we're going to share with you all once that's done. Um, policy last spring, um, they participated in 47 meetings with U.S. lawmakers in two days' time, both virtual and in person. So every year, the Youth Advisory Council does that whether or not they're on the policy committee. they the, All of them are committed to doing that. Um, let's see, next slide. Just really briefly, the real world skill building that we um, work with them in developing on the, especially the front end. Um, there's a list here, but you, the, the reason I'm highlighting right now goal setting and project management is because this is what they're involved doing right now. They are all setting their SMART goals for the year. The cohort runs through May. Um, they're developing um, skills around using project management tools and collaboration skills are a big component, but you see empathetic leadership is highlighted. That's because it's truly foundational to all of Bears Trojan's programming and initiatives. And we set through a two hour workshop for the YAC, we set a, um, an intensive that is um, interactive and it's completely focused on empathetic skill building. So we all wanna see more empathetic leaders in the world including here in the US. And so this is the intention that we have as they move into the year, it's learning how to operate with one another with active active listening skill building and um, understanding one another's perceptions, uh, all kinds of components to that, if there's conflict recovery. Um, so that's a real important part of what we do. So jumping on down to the um, other reason I'm here, um, next slide please, is how might the youth Advisory Council, the U.S. Youth Advisory Council for the Ocean Decade, connect impactfully with the U.S. National Committee. It's always been supportive. The U.S. National Committee, we thank you all so much, have always been supportive of the Youth Advisory Council and what they do. We're thinking now about a bigger and broader message um to the um to the world really at the un ocean decade conference i sit on the expert working group for challenge 10 and airs for oceans was one of the original decade implementation partners so we are lucky to have the communications we do at the ioc level and i can tell you that they're very interested in seeing more youth advisory councils at this level which is a meaningful um their their voices are amplified they do what they do they're not tokenized um at the um, and other and other states other UN member states, so what we had started thinking about, and I had mentioned it to Susan, which is why I'm here, is to process the UN Ocean Decade Conference might be an opportunity to model for other UN member states what meaningful engagement of youth 25 and, and under really we we engage 25 to 15 in the decade. So it's an opportunity for us to have the attention of other UN member states. Um, and and have a collaborative multi-generational workshop opportunity um, with the youth. I would be there, but I would like to bring eight youth from the Youth Advisory Council, um, prior cohorts and this cohort, to, to workshop with um, representatives from the U.S. National Committee um, how this can be done successfully. So the reason we're so committed, committed to this, um, Airs to Our Oceans, and also... Um, 
the Youth Advisory Council, is because 14-year-olds at the beginning of this decade are 24 at the end of the decade. They are well into their careers. And so what we're missing is that piece in mainstream education, um, the piece around connecting on our blue water planet and, and making that real world science, real world um, empowerment, skill building curriculum, really a component of moving forward into the ultimately choosing their careers. But also once they get it, we have a lot of university students actually who we work with, um, but then moving into their careers, no matter quite honestly, the industry to do good in those spaces and bring what they've learned through the importance of protecting our planet's waters and each other. We're very eco-justice oriented and intersectionality is a massive focus of what the Youth Advisory Council does. How does the, the impacts of our ocean impact human rights? So that's a very fast nutshell. Um, we'll send the deck so you can review further and I'm available for any questions anytime and, and the Youth Advisory Council is too. Um, I think I'm hopeful that they'll be presenting to you all their voices, this cohort, on your meeting on December 5th. We're looking for confirmation for that. But in the meantime, I'd love to discuss potentially um, partnering, collaborating on the UN Ocean Decade Conference. That's a big one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, April. Um, yeah, go ahead, Heather. Well, of course, my ears uh, perked up at the, no matter their areas of profession. And I think pointing out that particular really important time frame in somebody's life and thinking about okay I care about the oceans and how am I going to apply that in my career and I think one of the things that's challenging uh I know in the United States I think globally is seeing what that career path can be because um most people who work in marine sciences or marine biology don't have a job title that is marine biology and so um and there are many people who are contributing to uh, really important ocean work that are uh, not even scientists. So I anyway, I just, I think that something that highlights the wide array of possible career paths that are very, very reasonable and you can still be part of it is, is, a, is a great thing that could be done in the workshop. Oh, nice. I take notes while we're talking. I appreciate that. Is there already a commitment for the USNC to be actually at the UN Ocean Conference? Hmm. Well, I, I think there's the intent. Let me put it yeah. <laughs> at this point to to participate, and I'm sure some of our members will be there. And and it's my intention to be there as well. So, yeah. And um, but we are still sort of trying to formulate exactly what that's going to look like. I, and one of the things I was going to ask you, April, is you know, I, because I know you're interested in in expanding beyond the U.S. Mm -hmm. I, have you and working with um, the IOC, uh, the Decade Coordination Unit on that. Now, can you tell us a little bit about progress in that? Yeah. So um, after the second cohort, we created a toolkit. Um, which is disseminated by the IOC and NESCO, and that's to form a Youth Advisory Council. And Air Solutions is available on a consultation basis. What we're finding, though, and this is also goes to why we're interested in doing this, is it ends up being um, either dismissed. So um, I don't want to mention, I'm not going to mention the country. So there's uh, a country that we've been in communication with in Brazil. I mentioned the country. In South Africa. <laughs> South America, Africa, and Asia. And the challenge with them all is the, <laughs> the youth um, either not having um, any kind of agency or um, it's not, nothing's happening. It's not moving forward. It's typically one or the other. Um, that is actually, um, something that has has um, encouraged us to want to maybe do this with you all at the um, getting the audience of the UN member states. Um, because I think if it comes down from the top of the national committee level, um, then the support of universities, the support of orgs, um, there this is I think is successful because you have a supporting org in this case, that's Aristotle Ocean. You have a very um, supportive 
U.S. National Committee, and there is it was it was organized intentionally with autonomy so that they could, for instance, go to um, Capitol Hill and do various things. Um, but nonetheless, there's support, and I think the the opportunity to show what this might look like um, to allow youth to have voices on, with policy, um, with um, really thinking about also educational institutions, all different components they can bring in from their personal perspective, that toolkit, the education toolkits chuck full of perspective, which I'm excited to share. Um, but I do think it's an opportunity. We, we've not seen one as successful as this one internationally. Uh, Craig, go ahead. April, thank you. Um, the EU has been funding an ECOPS cohort and have have they engaged or are they a potential target of collaboration? Could you expand on that, please? Yeah. So we have thought about um, also including ECOPS. It's interesting because ECOPS at, um, you know, postgraduate and 35 year old, it's still considered youth. We specifically they target 25 year old because at that point the brain's fully formed and it's a youth or it's an adult in all respects. Um, the we are trying to bring more attention to this age group. But but in that, there have been youth of the um, the youth advisor council who are mentored by ECOPS. And we are looking for more um, time and energy put into that relationship, for sure. Yeah, that they would be more positioned, I think, like the US National Committee, where it's, it's more of a mentorship opportunity. Um, we've not collaborated with them as much as we have with the US National Committee. Um, that is, they seem very, very busy as postgraduate students, quite honestly. Um, it, it seems that they do better with independent mentors. But with that said, um, as this evolves and grows, uh, in the next year, as we hit the fifth cohort, we would like to establish a deeper relationship with ECOPS. One of the things that appeals to me in that model of blending the two or finding a relationship between the two is that the EU has been rather liberal with finding funds in order to support these activities. And maybe the EU could be encouraged to be reaching into even earlier career components in the way that you describe them. I like Thanks. that. I'm noting that. Thank you, sir. <laughs> um, so sort of along those lines, and then I'll get to Tom. Um, I'm wondering with the the alumni of the program, and maybe they could be also effective ambassadors for other countries because they've gone on to, mm -hmm. you know, their careers and now they're, you know, participants. And I'm, of course, I'm thinking of Madison right now, but I'm sure there are others as well. Yeah, we do have an alumni program that we stay in touch with the, um, those who are interested in supporting future cohorts, Madison has been incredible. In fact, she spoke at our orientation, um, such a success story, but other youth as well have come back in and are now running, for instance, a public speaking workshop or the policy advocacy workshop. Um, we, we, it is, it is truly uh, for, by, for youth by youth. And so we evolve according to um, youth feedback, but also um, the intention is by the end of the decade, youth are, are completely running it. And so we're already in those in those steps. Alumni are part of the support team. They work directly with the working group committees. Um, so the the intention is that they row into real leadership positions in the in the in the YAC. Um, but if anyone is interested in in partnering with us um, at the UN Ocean Conference, you know, it, it, any two, three would love to hear from you. Uh, my contact information, if you could put it on the screen, the last slide, that would be fantastic. Thank you so much. My contact information is just there on the bottom. And again, I'll be sending this deck out. Uh, Tom, go ahead. You, you sort of got to my question I think so, but I will say of every year when I think about what this committee has done, the most enjoyable thing we do is hear from 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 from, from the yak mm -hmm. itself. So glad. And I would suggest that the best selling card is the success of the students afterwards, whether they go into ocean science or not. If you're using ocean science to create engaged citizens it really doesn't matter what they're engaged in. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think that's that's the carrot to hang in front of 
people is that we have a successful program that has produced an engaged citizenry. Not everyone's going to be a marine scientist, even if they're not called a marine scientist. Not everyone's going to go into science. Um, but it, but if they feel empowered through that process, then that's just outstanding. Yeah, we've had um, several youth actually change career trajectory to environmental science or environmental policy. In fact, I'm writing for letter of recommendation on my way home tonight. <laughs> um, so it, 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 it has been impactful in that way for certain. And part of that impact is the support multi-generally, multi, multi-generationally from you all as you um, listen to them and um, appreciate what they have to say. So thank you for that. Liz? Um, April, very nice to meet you. You as well. I uh, just commend you for rallying the next generation. Uh, it's mission critical. It's a national security imperative that we have people who care. And I think what you've created certainly is um, a road to success. I guess my question is, was heirs to our oceans a thing before the decade came along? And can you talk a bit about Yeah. That? Thanks. Yeah, so Airs to Our Ocean is an international youth organization. It formed in 2016. And its intention is to equip essentially the next generation of leaders um, with the skill sets they need to create a, a safer, healthier world. So we go deep into skill building. We go very deeply into, um, into emp real world in, um, empowerment skills that you saw the list there of. Um, but also the the three buckets, the that's the center bucket. The first one is convene and connect. So we connect youth from um, wide, wide range around the globe um, in in overcoming challenging human barriers. Um, often they're um, cultural, often they're demographic, religion, different pieces that otherwise would have separated us um, and connecting them in purpose. Um, then there's the education and, and uh, empowerment commitment that I that we'd shared, but then also act and advocate. So we not only help them articulate their stories, um, both either through public speaking and presenting, but also um, storytelling and, and digital and media as well. Um, and then also we find platforms for them to amplify their voices. So the YAC would be fall squarely in that. Um, yeah, so there's there's different programs and initiatives. Okay, well, I'm going to take, and since I have the microphone, I'm going to turn to Craig, who's got probably much more experience in this um, area than anyone else in the room, and really talk about, you know, what types of activities would you imagine at the Ocean Conference in Barcelona that would make sense for us as the U.S. National Committee to work with the IAC? Uh, is there a model out there for us to, to really develop a, a meaningful activity? I think what's been most impressive in any of the gatherings, whether it's the Our Ocean Conference or whether it's the UN Ocean Conference, any of them, is is to hear people speaking from the heart. And if you had people of that youth cadre, that cohort, who never get a chance to be heard other than in small groups that are already reinforcing the purpose of having youth speak, but to give youth a podium and let them have something to express. I think that could be very impactful. And to go back to the the CD part, as, as Tom and as Mark were mentioning, the capacity development for sustainable development, the CD for SD, right? We, we, you're developing capacity mm -hmm. with these useful people, youthful people in order to do what as they mature into their career. And what is their vision for, for what the ocean future might look like? Now, the, the stereotypical crusty, um, old white male, of which I belong to that class, would be, oh my gosh, what do these kids have to say? But there's been enough said here at this meeting to make us realize that they will be the people who have their hands on, on the throttle and the control if, if we give them the tools. So letting people speak from the heart could be, I think, a number one, a, a, an intellectual opportunity. It's also a photo opportunity for maybe members of high state order to come in and be part of that and say, oh, my God, I want my picture taken with all these youngsters from around the globe. There's a there's a visibility that then enhances that opportunity. So I think there are a lot of attributes for why creating such a forum as that would be very advantageous because it's an earlier group than the ECOPS. 
And um, the other point that I would make is to try and and recruit individuals who have specific ideas and visions, though they may be borrowed from elsewhere, but to hear it said in the voice of young people that um, that they, they can almost be actionable, that they could see what the reality is. And um, people often discount the voice of youth because it's because it's youth mm -hmm. and and we're picking people because the value of their thoughts not simply because they're younger and um, you can get a, a good collection of folks there so that's one thing that i would i would see doing i think that's a nice accommodation the other thing might be is um, use that as a poster for recruitment of other nations too as sue and others were leading this conversation use that as a poster for hey you can do this too and and imagine what the spread would be because I think too too deeply rooted in the UN decade machinery is the idea that we stop at the ECOPS and you've mm -hmm. pointed out April very well that yeah okay that's one threshold but there is also a, a subordinate by age not not by value but a subordinate group and cohort that's coming up so I I think you could um, you could make an impact there and it shows the leadership of the U.S. side in order to be putting some visibility in in that. Mm -hmm. So those, off the top of my head, those are the first two ways that I would go. Don't make it too complicated. You don't have to. Just let the young people speak. It's their world too. We've messed it up for them and they're going to have to figure out how to get out of it. Thank you. Really appreciate your thoughts. Really appreciate it. So um, Dan had his hand up first and then I'll go to David. Yeah, I just wanted to reinforce what, what, what Tom and... Um, which what was just said in that I think back at all the functions we've had at the and the UN committee and I just keep going back to the youth presentations and you just kind of go wow the future's bright there is a future where you know you get so wound up in all the other stuff but you see these young voices and young faces diverse young faces and you go we're we're going to get there so I, I agree with everything what you just said I think that's really puts a face on the future. David? Yeah, I, I just reinforce what was said. I, my question to you, April, is do you have a platform already at the conference or are you looking to use the satellite event, the mechanism for satellite events to create a platform at the conference? So for the USDAC specifically, um, I'm, we are going to be meeting as Decade Implementation um, partners next week, and that's going to be discussed there. Um, the other piece is, um, I think it's October 15th when the in-conference proposal, call for proposals is opened. So that's going to be a space that we're going to um, also submit for. Um, but this one in particular, um, there's other there's other paths, other different ways. Um, but this one felt extraordinarily meaningful to impress upon other UN member states um, the importance of, of doing this in a meaningful way. Um, so it is unique and special in my mind. Yeah, I'm not a member of the committee, obviously, but I mean, what you're pitching, I fully support and think mm -hmm. is extremely impactful. I met your daughter, I presume it was your daughter at the UN Ocean Conference. Ah, and okay. um, she was extremely inspiring. <laughs> Um, is this um, on the, at the side event or in the plenary? It was at the plenary. Okay, so it's Charlie. Yeah, well, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, so I think just for my own clarification, so are you planning to have a, a platform or is that with the... That uh, we are, the, yes. Yeah. The, the intention okay. is that there is, um, there are different avenues that mm -hmm. depending upon when things open and, and what that right. looks like. Um, yes, that's the intention. So I, I think you can see from the discussions, both um, with Rania and also with April, that there, there are opportunities for the U.S. National Committee, and you know, I, and they're related because we are thinking about you know sort of expanding our reach internationally, not just having our own U.S. focus. And what can we what can we contribute to this international discussion? You know, both in terms of other U.S. national, other other national committees, <laughs> and um, and then also thinking about um, encouraging the development of other youth advisory councils. 
and just to bring it full circle so it shouldn't fail to recognize with us that this also speaks to the diversity equity inclusion belonging justice study that the committee is trying to launch because if we focus that on university students we've we've given the game away yes and did you have a comment liz or or nicole no okay yeah okay go go liz yeah <laughs> Actually, what I did want to mention relative to the Ocean Decade Conference is mindful of, of the fact you heard it mentioned earlier of this Vision 2030 process, which yet another phrase, yes, in the decade land, you have to now come <laughs> understand. Um, so essentially, there are these writing teams that are developed, and Frank, I think, mentioned there's like several Americans involved. So I kind of mind who those Americans were on those writing committees, and I sent them a copy of this fancy little report you all yeah. provided, because you did put time and energy into thinking what this success looks like. And as I understand this whole vision of 2030 process, is it's th these teams have been charged with trying to articulate that, what is a successful decade? And so I just reminded the Americans on the team that we've got some information here that may they may find useful and i guess i wanted to ask uh april too did did the yaks i mean i know this is a little in the weeds for them but you know it may be worthwhile asking them what they think of how success has been defined here it just might be an interesting thought exercise and i don't know if that they want this that they have the time or that whether or not this would entertain is that online the publication it is it's on the national committee website okay okay i and that was kind of, it was recently was it a, a relative new? Okay. It, yeah, it came out a year, about a year ago. Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna see about. Um, I think that would be a good project potentially for the education committee. So let me propose that. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. A question for the committee. Um, that was a good pub. It was a good product. Has that been distributed to the Hill, the House and Senate Oceans Caucus, and what's a pro plural of caucus? Cockeye. I don't know. But it. it <laughs> Have we made made the rounds with that? Because that I think could start to help one of the the I'll say stalled frustrations that the national committee has, which is, hey, we've done all this work. What's come of it? Mm -hmm. And and it could liberate some of the thinking. And if you get the thinking liberated, maybe you get some funds liberated from the Congress about this unique opportunity of leveraging. We got half the decade left by the time you formulate the next budget and see it appropriated. So maybe maybe there's a round of visits that the committee can make with that in hand or to encourage the house and senate oceans, oceans caucus says i'll go that way instead to um to to have an event it wouldn't be a hearing they don't have hearings but they have events where the national committee can offer its expression of this was this was the purpose for our creation this is our ambition clearly stated in a, a well-structured report and now where's the beef where, where are we going with this and um i just think that's a way to get more visibility on the needs through the vehicle of the u.s national committee so the the I'm a member of the committee that put together the report, but I will, I will say that, you know, I think it's a lot to digest when you look at the whole report, but we also have a presentation, but maybe an infographic, just one infographic or a couple that sort of describe each one of the themes would be easier to distribute and explain. Oh, and even uh, if you remember the presentation, we kind of have the infographics already there. So yeah, that, that would be something that would be relatively easy. I mean, I can get back to um, Craig and one of the, so typically at the academies, we will put out um, basically an offer to, to brief a report and it's up to Congress to say, yes, we're interested. Um, and that's that's sort of our typical process. But if we if we had some non-federal money, and you understand why it has to be non-federal money, we could host an event, and then invite you know the staff to come to hear about the and of course also you know the members to come and hear about the report. But we can't do that with federal funds, <laughs> so mm. um, that's that's one of the constraints.
But I do like the idea, you know, a lot of work went into the cross-cutting themes report and um, and I think there's there's a lot there's a lot of good material in there. And so how we can get more mileage out of it, I think is really, and really, you know, start to get some action. It's not, you know, not just getting it out there, but also stimulating some action is, you know, is something that the committee would really be behind. Yeah, Nicole? I'm just using up all my time here. Uh, <laughs> I really like Liz's idea. I think it's more, and I'm not surprised by that. I, I think it's more than an, a thought exercise. I think there's a real potential uh, visceral outcome with the what does success look like in year X, right? Mm -hmm. um, as written by a bunch of old farts. And then recast, if not in totality, but in the implementation, in the granularity by folks that will be X age at that time. Right, you may not, and maybe you would, but maybe you don't invite them to rewrite them, but to say, okay, so this is what the old farce came up with. What does it look like in your mind? And it's crystal balling, but it allows them to envision themselves at a certain age and these outcomes at a certain state. And I think it's, I think it's powerful. Maybe it is a thought exercise, but I think it could be a very powerful way to engage them in this work. And now they could look at the list and say, this is hogwash, right? And that's data. Right, but they may also look at it and be able to find themselves in it and provide feedback for what that that granularity looks like in X number of years, right, in their lives. You know, I'm thinking the that other thing really would be powerful. Yeah, the other thing they could think about is if they're, you know, if it, if the AC is interested, that this could also be something we could develop for the Barcelona conference. You know, sort of speaking from the heart and maybe taking you know, some of those. Mm -hmm. You know, this is this is what success would look like. For, as far as we're concerned, because all of the themes that are outlined in that report are mapped onto the decade challenges. That's right. So it's a very, yeah, you know, it's a very integrative um, system. And if there is something that you know really speaks to some of the the ACT members, then the committee members could help you know them develop this into something that they could present. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you know that conversation could be an enticing way to demonstrate to the youth of other countries or the old mm -hmm. farts of other countries yeah. that this is what dialogue could look like, right? It might be a nice, it might be a powerful modeling exercise also if you were to do it in Barcelona. Also, it's coming to mind is this amazing um, video where you have both um, an elder and a youth speaking to the same time and place um, in a in a stylistically very um, engaging way. Sorry, I'm thinking Kunk on Earth. If anyone's seen that, it's yes. absolutely fantastic. Absolutely. But same sort of thing where you've got you know somebody's ideas being challenged, um, but or teased out, if you will. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. and it'd be great if we That's could right. get Keep some videography and. <laughs> I have a I have a follow up suggestion. If you if you were to take someone who is of of a native culture from anywhere in the world, and you listen to them, so I I just heard from a a young man who was speaking of his grandfather's telling him, young man, this is what you what you're going to see and what you're going to look forward to. The grandfather who was 83 years old had the compilation of knowledge from multiple previous generations times a thousand this is what happens at this time of year that's when the butterflies come that's what type of fish are here when etc and the man said 30 years ago everything that i had to tell you became obsolete mm -hmm. and and useless because we're now learning anew what the new patterns and the behavior of our environment might be and and those sorts of things i remember when we were at ocean OBS 19 and there was an entire panel of folks who were, were representing their culture and, and their ancestral experience. And that in and of itself was impactful because it's not just that we're looking at an age class distinction, the, the old versus the young. Mm -hmm. We're also looking at in the eyes and wisdom of the people who do have these ages and they speak to represent the ancestral ages as well. And now that's all changed. 
So I, I think that's um, that might be a nice juxtaposition. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And I know it's not the business of this group, but there is no speaker of the house. Oh. <laughs> so April, is this helpful? Are we, it is, do you think yeah. we're coming up with some yeah, and the nuggets of some. Yeah, and um, I think it's beautiful. I I like I like the um, the enthusiasm and and creativity. And again, if anyone's going to be there and wants to to dive in together with the youth, it would be wonderful. You'll be there. Oh, right on. Can I give you my card? Excellent. <laughs> Yeah, and I see Madison also put in the chat that she's going to be there and she's she'll sign up too. <laughs> so. Excellent. And Madison, I'd love to um, explore some other things with you as well. I think you probably knew that was coming. Oh, you will be. All right. I'd love to, to share my card with you. Yeah, so I think I think we had the nucleus of a, of a program to uh, to really develop further for the uh, Barcelona conference, which is great. Yeah, that's marvelous. Um, and is anyone sensitive around, um, you know, the way in which do we make it an in-conference workshop or a side event, or does anyone have a, a druthers around that? I mean, we have to, it'd be a call for proposal, right? For the, of course, for the um, the in-conference, um, not yet opened, opening next week, from what I understand, but with a side event, the deadline to submit is the end of this month. So we'd want to think about what that is. We could do, we could go for try both, see which one pans out. <laughs> I was just going to say I really appreciated your workshop concept. I think you know there's going to be a lot of mm -hmm. panels, but this a workshop for this topic would be I think much more effective. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's just. My 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 thought. I think we'll have plenty of plenty of panels. There's a lot of creativity in what these events side events can look like, but a, a workshop could be very very effective in this space. I think. I agree. Keep everyone awake and engaged. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just to get them in the room <laughs> well, you know, but i guess that you know seriously though i am thinking about that i mean how how we we do have to think about how we are going to get the right people in the room mm -hmm. right and so and put some i do think effort out i on see is going to have an interest in in having you at member states move in if there's a real if we have a real collaboration mm -hmm. yeah so just a, one of those things that you know in planning this we should keep that in mind from the from the beginning of how we're going to really get a good get the get the correct audience really for sure and i'd be reaching out to you fairly soon because um you know we do have the decade of meditation partner meeting next week and i'd love to be able to say hey we're we have our team who's, who's interested in in doing this to get that support well thank you and lynn did you want to say something yeah it's just a question i'm um, just um wondering what the timeline our committee's workshop um, ideas is um, with the DEI and the data. And if those have any focus that can lead up to the April meeting or is the timing just off? Mm -hmm. Or if we can um, use them to leverage them to um, make something a little larger, more encompassing, that's more international UN decade. Uh, yeah, so we have the inclusive and equitable, and now the workshops will be held before the April conference. I'm not sure if the proceedings will be available before that, but we could still have, um, I, there's no reason why a member of the planning committee couldn't participate in the conference. Um, if there was, I don't know if they would really have um, the bandwidth to organize something for the conference themselves, but I can imagine if there was the right 
um, activity that they would, you know, they could certainly talk about the experience that they had from those workshops. Yeah, I guess I noticed in timelines that um, mm -hmm. uh, proposals are open for all these side events until the end of this month and not beyond. So mm -hmm. anything would be discussed, that would be good. Yeah, I, I'd feel guilty if I gave this planning committee another task right now. So, you know, but I mean, I, we can certainly ask them if they'd be interested, you know, in the side event, but uh, I don't want, I won't assign it to them. How's that? <laughs> A question for the folks who are more involved in this now than I am, but is there still a an IOC-led body that convenes the National Planning Committees? And is there, okay, and is there a way to sneak in the side door on that and have the U.S. National Committee co-sponsor with the IOC a, a Congress of the National Committees? In, in in my trip to New York, there were three chairs of National Committees for the decade who approached me and said, what do we do? Because they're having the same challenge. They have a lot of great thoughts, but but implementing those thoughts is the real challenge for them. So a possible strategy would be to find the U.S. National Committee in a role to, to co-sponsor an event with that body that aggregates all of the National Committee reps. Shows the leadership. It could be uh, an easy easy to produce. I don't know what the finances would be, but um, based on what's available versus what would be demanded. But I think that's a good role for the United States. Yeah. Um, so I see that Olivier Ducourneau is on the line from IOC. And I don't know if you're awake, Olivier, because I know it's quite late where you are. But if you are, do you want to say anything about sort of having this convening of the National Decade Committees? Well, yeah, yeah, I'm still, I can confirm I'm still awake and, and thanks, thanks a lot for, for bringing this, this uh, great uh, idea. Uh, indeed, uh, we're, we're um, uh, starting to, to see how, uh, uh, how national decade committees can, uh, can uh, uh, participate in the different events. Uh, not only through the um, uh, the uh, the the satellite events they might organize and lead themselves, but also will will review all the different uh, satellite events to see how you can you can uh, contribute to others. But uh, back to your back to your suggestion, uh, yes, this is definitely something that uh, that we would like to discuss with the. With you and with uh, with a few other committees, I know that the the UK uh, also uh, national committee um, had the same uh, the same uh, idea and proposal. This is something we can discuss next uh, uh, next week during the during the meeting of uh, of uh, NDC focal points, and uh, and of course if if there's a um, an interesting um, agenda that comes uh, out of the of the meeting would be uh, um, happy to um, uh, well to consider this uh, this proposal. Thank you so much, Olivier, for jumping in, and I really appreciate that you were able to join us um, this afternoon and your evening. You're welcome. Yes. So I know we're um, getting to, you know, happy hour time here. So it's 10 after five. And uh, <laughs> uh, so I really thank everyone for um, a really productive two days. I know it's a very, also a very demanding two days of meetings. And I um, really appreciate everyone joining us. Um, particularly, I'll give a shout out to our speakers and April for coming <laughs> to join us today. Um, I think we've really made a lot of progress in terms of, you know, thinking about what we can do, um, certainly at the Barcelona conference, but, you know, more impactfully, really thinking about, you know, what we can contribute as the U.S. National Committee to to the decade. So, so thanks, everyone. And uh, uh, we will have our next decade uh, U.S. National Committee for the Ocean Decade um, call is going to be, uh, I think, in November. but. I can't remember what the, what the date is, but it's usually the first week in November. So, and that's gonna be uh, devoted to um, John Delaney's Urban Seas. 
So this is part two. We've already had part one, but John signed us up for part two. <laughs> so we will have that. And then we're going to be meeting with the new next cohort of um, the Youth Advisory Council at the December 5th meeting. So thanks, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Very much. Yes.